right. Here we go. Three, two, one. Boom, and welcome to the Big Honker Podcast brought to you by Dive Bomb Industries. I'm Jeff Stanfield with the world famous Andy Shaver. That's right. Yep. Me today. You Just today. Me. Just me. You're the only one here? Nope. Nope. Or you're the only world famous one. <laughs> the only saying. world famous. Yeah. Well, this guy in the room might be more famous than you, Andy. He 100% is. He's got a blue check mark on your Instagram. Oh, is that what is that what that means? That's what that yep. means. Locally famous. <laughs> That's yeah. me. I'm known at Allsops, but nowhere else. No. <laughs> <At all sips. laughs> My wife today, last night, she told me, she goes, you know, first of all, Chef Jean-Paul Bourgeois. Mm-hmm. Did I say the last name right? You, dude, dude, every time I come on, you get better and better. I'm telling I mean, you. Right, you're just spot on this time, so just stick with that. The Kunas is coming. You know why? It's because I have Kunas here all the time. That's, now. Uh, yeah, and a I'm, couple of them from Lake Charles, right? Great here. people. My favorite people in the world are Kunas's. Yeah, they're not too bad. No, the good guys. I do need to apologize to a customer of ours that we had. Um, we had the first complaint for the year this year, and it was my fault. Why are we buzzing here? I don't know. I think it's that fan. I hear it. Feedback. It's got yeah. Feedback. Don't know what it was, but that was the fan. Better, yeah. I'm telling you. Anyways, I, I screwed up this week. I had guys check in on Friday. I'd been to the airport, gotten back here. Had a flat tire that day. Had a long day Friday. Had mm. listened to my wife complain to me about what I'd done wrong getting a flat tire. <laughs> and so, anyways, the guy got here. I checked in. I forgot to tell him we had a social room. So the first day, him and his family sat in the room all day and didn't do shit other than hunt. I felt real bad about that. So it's my apologies. But that was kind of like a perfect storm too because it was raining that day. Most of the time people will follow the crowd. Like they see groups and then they'll kind of follow. Yeah, but it's my fault. I should say it was dumping rain. Yes. So like there was nobody outside. To well, I will be follow. making sure that everyone last night at dinner, I told everybody in the place, listen, we have a TV room, go over there. Anyways, I felt bad about that. And that bothers me. The things I can control bother me. But anyways, so last night we're at home <clears throat> and Michelle goes, I know what I'm going to get Chef Jean Paul tomorrow. I go, what? She goes, I'm going to go buy him a gut bomb from Awesome's. I go, why? She goes, he needs to have one. I, I said, know. Michelle, he lives in fucking Texas. I think they have an Awesome's where he's at. I think he, he he lives down by Houston. I don't think they have one there. I said, I bet he's had a grocery store bean burrito before in his life. Oh. That's gut, a gut bomb. That's a gut bomb. Have you had one before? From Bucky's, I feel like. Same same thing. Yes. Fried burrito. A fried burrito always. with the taco, the, the taco sauce. Also, what makes theirs good is their sauce they put on. I'm it. pretty sure that's what Blake had before getting in, getting in the blind. <laughs> he's got a, ass. No, he's had a nervous stomach the last couple of days. I don't know. <laughs> he needs some tapioca or something in his life. It's because he's he going to go to Mexico. He needs some of those athletic greens I drink. That's, get that yeah. gut right. Tell me about it. I, try, I eat good healthy. I eat a salad every day. There you go. But he, uh, yeah, Blake's going to go to Mexico without his fiance, so that's why he's got a nervous stomach. No. <clears throat> Blake's not going to go. That would be stupid. If he went? Oh, fuck yeah, I'd be dumb. Why do you keep inviting him then? To see how stupid he really is. Oh, well, that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> he's not going to do it. There's no way. Um, so you've had a gut bomb. Yes. And you've been to Bucky's. I have. Bucky's is the greatest Texas institution there is. It's surpassed Whataburger because Whataburger is now owned by Yankees. I would agree. Bucky's is a pretty phenomenal and incredible place. Whether you go there on every road trip you take in Texas or the first time you go, it just never ceases to amaze me right. how many people are in that joint and they <laughs> basically perfected here go get gas and then cruise around for 15 minutes and buy mm-hmm. you some sh- tchotchkes and right. i don't know egg biscuit or whatever the hell they're they cooking have, uh, boudins they have boudin, boudin kolaches. Kolaches are out of this world <laughs> yeah here's the thing oh here's I, a real coon ass oh, like, about here's it. the thing like i heard steve ranella had to tried one day to tell me what good boudin was and oh. And I had to, I had to set him straight. Sorry, Steve. I'm gonna bring it up again. We did this on your podcast. I'm gonna bring it up again. And Texas, I, I would say Houston is your best bet to get Buda in Texas because it's proximity to Louisiana. What about Beaumont? Well, yeah. The further the further east you get, the better the Buda gets. And then once you get out of Louisiana, it all sucks again. So Mississippi is bad. <laughs> Yeah, well, Mississippi, like, you know, they try to have their Mardi Gras down down in the southern coastal part of Mississippi because they're like, oh, it started and we started Mardi Gras. I'm like, eh, but you didn't perfect it at all. <laughs> uh, and that's kind of like every other piece of cooking that Mississippi tries to take from Louisiana. They, of course, they can make gumbo, you know, but it's always going to be just not quite the same. And that's what I want to say about the boudin. In fact... There's a donut shop in my home in my hometown, um, not my hometown where I grew up, but where I live now in Montgomery, and great little donut shop. 
nice apple fritters, big apple fritter guy. And they spelled boudin wrong. And I noticed that y'all spell boudin as B-O-U-D-A-I-N a lot. Mm. And that's the first red flag. I'm There's like, no A in it, is it? There's I no A. a. Yeah, B-O-U-D-I-N, boudin, right. not yeah. boudin. Right, right. And so people start, and I'm like, yeah, y'all got to get this straight, If you can't man. spell <laughs> the shit right, you ain't going to cook yeah, it right. you're not going to get me. I'm, I'm, I'm off it, yeah. No, nah, I'm, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm playing partially. And, uh, but, you know, I got to stand up for my, my state's kind What's of that? legacy. I, I think that's a kind of a legacy food of, of Louisiana. It, it's spreading throughout the kind of coastal south, if you will. And uh, good boudin, that's something. But it ain't rice dressing. That's what we get wrong. Rice dressing and boudin are not the same. What is rice dressing? Rice dressing is like meat and rice and, and seasoning and so on put together. Boudin has liver in it. It has, it's oh. an emulsified thing. It's like soft. It's like, it's different. It's just different. Somebody was telling me the first time I try, I was going to try boudin, it, they were like, it's all the scrap pieces. And I, I mean... I don't taste that at all. They're like, don't ask what's in it, because then you won't eat it. I'm like, huh? I think that's mostly due to the liver. For the most part, people oh. will make boudin with your, with a shoulder or a pork butt, mm -hmm. and then pork liver. Now, historically, a lot of Cajun food, like cracklins, which is the fat back or right. lot, you know the belly, a lot of times, a lot of that Cajun food was made from the leftover parts, right. and boudin was probably uh, no exception. But currently. Um, the way it's made is probably wouldn't find that. But again, like you got to have the liver in it. How much you have, that's debatable. That's right. up to personal preference. But that's a, that's a, you know, one of those things that makes boudin stand out and gives it its kind of lore in the culinary world, you know, and which is different from like jambalaya or which is another rice dish of Cajun mm -hmm. country or rice dressing, which is another, you know, dish of Southern food. So I don't know. So, I'm Tony not, was telling me about a video. They were making crackling. What did they pour over it to get it to... Uh, let me see if I can find it. He asked me if I saw the video, and I was like, no, I didn't see any fucking video. I, I like boudin. Is it and hot I love oil? Real boudin. I don't like the shit you buy in a grocery store in Texas. I don't like that boudin. That's not boudin. Someone makes it homemade, or if you go to one of the markets in mm -hmm. southern Louisiana and get it, yep. and a guy used to send me some sometimes somewhere, and it was one of those markets somewhere south of Baton Rouge, a famous place for it. And that's good shit. I love that stuff on the grill. What stuff's damn good. Yeah. And I've got a guy in Wichita Falls that makes some. And he sent us some, Gary Coker, a client of ours, but he grew up in Beaumont. Well, he's mm -hmm. a he's a he's a counterfeit coon ass, but he's pretty close. But he yeah. makes real good coon ass food. Yeah. Is his boudin good? It's very good. It makes really good boudin. And then tonight the boudin we're gonna have that Mr. Vincent brung us is real coon ass boudin too. I wonder where he got it from. I think he said he got it from the market basket on Jenner. Boulevard in Lake Charles. He says that's the, some of the best boudin in, in Louisiana. Is that the market basket? He said only the one in only one on on Jenner Boulevard or Jenner Street in Lake Charles. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw this out here now. So it's, what? Hold on. What are they doing here on this pork rind shit? All right. Can people at home see this? Yes. On, okay. What are they doing? All right. So that is not how you make cracklings or gratons in the Cajun in the Cajun way. That is a very common method used throughout most of the other um, world who makes similar things. But that's a whole roasted like pork shoulder or pork ham that's been slow salted and slow roasted. And then he takes like super hot oil. I'm talking 450, 475 degrees. And he pops it over that skin, which is where or he makes it crackling, which is why it gets its name. Right. So he says pork rinds. <clears throat> we would call that. That's not a gratin. Are our crackling of Louisiana that a pork rind is skin that is cooked and dried and then deep fried, and that's what you buy at the store. At the store in the back. The store, but gratons, that's a different thing. That is even fat back or pork belly that has been treated the same way, slow cooked and a cat all, cut in chunks, slow cooked in a cast iron kettle till it renders. Then once it's rendered, they take the pork rinds out. They raise the they raise the heat of the of the grease till you know the the. The way that a lot of people say you can test it is if you get a strike anywhere match and drop it in the drop it in the grease, it'll catch on fire. Ooh. That's that's how you test how hot it is. And then you throw those pork rinds back in and they and they pop. They they crackling, which is why they get their name. But that is skin, fat, and meat attached as a like a nugget, mm -hmm. if you will. I don't think I've ever had real 
cracklings. So is that how they're going to serve that? They're just going to cube that up and then it's going to be everything in one bite with the video that we just saw? Or will they separate the the skin and the meat and all that? Likely what you're going to see on that video if you would see if there if the whole video was available is that they would remove that skin once okay. it's cracked then pull that meat mm-hmm. and then add that crackling or 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 pork rind right. whether whether they put it on a sandwich or eat it on a plate just to add like extra texture crunchy and, texture and crunchy stuff that like makes that. sense and you see some barbecue guys throughout North Carolina Sam Jones does that really well Pat Martin out of Nashville does that really well well and that's their whole hog whole hog barbecue where they're cooking under coals and they'll pull that meat and they'll cra- they'll flip that hog at the mm-hmm. very end, stoke the coals, get that get that skin to crack, and then they'll serve that as as barbecue, as whole hog barbecue. Like, I've never had whole hog, hog barbecue. Have you, Jeff? No, I've always wanted to. That's the only, in my opinion, the only barbecue in the United States that rivals like Texas barbecue traditions. The whole hog barbecue of the Carolinas and also Eastern Tennessee. Uh, just has a very storied history mm-hmm. in the barbecue world and barbecue kind of kind of circles. Uh, you know, I'll, Texas. I've eaten barbecue all over the country, all over the world. A matter of fact, uh, I would say, man, it's just hard to beat. Not just the hill country areas of Texas, just the 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 way y'all treat barbecue here in Texas. And then there's then there's the whole hog style barbecue, which is a dying art. You ver- you see very little people cook barbecue in that way one of my favorite uh episodes ever with anthony bourdain is he was in uh bayou country mm-hmm. tafali basin and they did a whole hog somewhere he was at and it was pretty interesting the way they got to and it might have been andrew zimmerman it was one of those that went down there and did it i think it was bourdain though yeah. but they did a whole hog down there and i've always wanted to do a whole hog i'm not a brisket guy so i'm not a texas barbecue guy mm-hmm. i'm not a big brisket eater and i'm not memphis the ribs I do not like the rendezvous i don't like the dry rub at all. I want the wet, sloppy yeah. ribs. So I like Kansas City ribs better than I do Memphis ribs. I got, quite honestly, I'm not sure. No, I, look, rendezvous is an institution, and people are going to go. They've done really well for themselves. So I don't understand why people like going to get those ribs. I agree I with you. Either. I just, they're just very unimpressed. Their macaroni and cheese was pretty good, but I will put my wife's macaroni and cheese up against her macaroni and cheese. Oh, <laughs> Miss Michelle crushed that mac and cheese. <laughs> Woof. Let me ask Last you night. this on brisket. Could you put just a little bit of sugar to help with a bark? Or is that sacrilegious? You know, I think most, I'm not a Texan, I'm Louisiana, and I would say you do what you want, make it taste good. Right. You know, I think most Texans would say that might, like, purists might say that's sacrilegious. But I, I think that most Texas pit masters that could create great brisket, they'll tell you it's salt and pepper, right. and that's mostly true. But I think they're leaving out a couple of little things. They're not going to let you know their secret. They have exactly. to. Because Bond, yeah. the brisket's as black as Jeff's vest most of the time. By Shin Gear. But, I mean, it's just, it's just I don't, and obviously I'm not cooking it on the same smoker as they are or anything like that. But, like, if my brisket's black like that, it's fucking burned. Is, is the lady still alive? The famous lady from down there that was, like, 157 years old that was cooking? Did she pass away finally? I was in it t- where? In the, what? In, in somewhere in, in, Louisiana? in the Texas, in the Hill Country. They did a show on her on Netflix or something. It was a barbecue show. Oh, was, you're talking about... Um, if you say her name, I'll From be, Snow's Barbecue. Yes, yes, that's the lady. She's still alive. Yeah, she, she's yeah. an old lady. Have you ever had her food? Is it Tootsie? Tootsie. Yeah. I would like to try that, but I don't want to stand... I'm not standing in line for three hours to eat freaking brisket. And you can only go on a Saturday. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not wasting a Saturday <laughs> or three hours waiting in line. Yeah, look, I've heard it's, I heard it's phenomenal. I heard it, you know... Snow's? Snows. I've I've heard it beats Aaron Franklin's. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, people. Part of me wonders, you know, by standing in line for three hours and waiting on this food. Yes, you're, it's you're hungry. You're on, mm-hmm. you're inclined to like love it because who the hell wants to stand in line right. for that long? And be like, uh, it wasn't quite what I <laughs> was hoping for, but glad I wasted all my Saturday morning. When you're hungry, <clears throat> the best fried chicken I've ever had in my life was in Nakona, Texas. About. 35 years ago, me and my dad had been somewhere training dogs all day, and we went to eat at a place, and it was closed, and it was on the way home, and we hadn't eaten since like 6 in the morning. It's about 8 o'clock at night. There was a fried chicken place in Nocona, Texas. We pulled in there and got a bucket of chicken. That was the best fried chicken I've ever had in my life. It was also the worst fried chicken I ever had in my life because after one piece of chicken, <laughs> it tastes like shit, and we threw it out the window. And that's And we were two fat boys hungry, so... You're right so about how the hungry. Does, how does that how does that work? Oh, because the first one so was hungry. good. It tasted good. But the second piece, when I wasn't so hungry, it was not good at all. We threw it out. Now so, fried fried chickens, that's another that's one another one of those southern foods that like 
It is highly debated. There's a lot of different <laughs> ways to do it, and there's there's good ones and bad ones. And the lady in New Orleans, man, it's the best <clears throat> chicken I've ever had. Willie Mays? No, the other one. Uh, Leah Chase? I don't know if she did fried chicken. No, it's it, it, it's an it's it's somewhere outside. It's somewhere around Bourbon Street. I wish Michelle could name the place. And it's mm. famous for it. And their chicken wings. They had the biggest freaking chickens I've ever seen in my life. Them suckers are this little big. Biggest piece of chicken. I had that. And Michelle had chili. Willie's. Willie's. I think it was Willie. Willie's been to Willie. Chicken Shack. I think so. It's on Bourbon it's, Street. It's just an old house. Boy, they had good chicken. Never been. There. I've never <clears> been <throat> to the. What was the other lady's? The, the lady that's real famous that lives in Seventh Ward or Well, Ward? Willie Willie Mays is is a famous fried chicken place in in New Orleans. They actually have a number of them now. Leah Chase, who's passed away, she was considered the queen of Creole food of Louisiana. This was an old white house looking thing that they had converted into a restaurant. And it was, food was excellent. Mm. It's somewhere down close to where uh, uh, the, the Jean Lafitte's bar is. Jean Lafitte. Yeah, yes. Jean Lafitte. Somewhere you know down there. I say my name. You know, Jean, yeah. Jean, Jean Lafitte. <laughs> Jean. Lafitte. <laughs> okay, Jean. And the other good chicken place I had was in Nashville, and that's is it Hattie B's? Yeah, the hot, hot chicken. Hot Mother chicken. clucking. Boy, that shit is hot, but it is good. It is. They do a good job. Mm-hmm. They do a good job. And their frozen um, Jim Beam and Cokes, pretty damn good, too. But we were talking, and I'm sure like when you're sitting out to have barbecue, you're smelling all the smoke and all the aroma and everything. So that's just adding to like the, it's hiding in the odds that you're going to go in and really, really enjoy what you're got in front of you. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Look, I'm I'm sh- I'm sure those places are great. Again, I'm, I've had Aaron Franklin's barbecue, phenomenal. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not going to stand in line again, but it was right. great. Uh, I've never been to Snows and never had that barbecue, but I I know a lot of guys who have who I trust, and they say it's the best in Texas. So I believe them. Um, you know, am I going to hustle down there on a you know on a on a Friday night, stay Friday night, and wake up Saturday. Probably not. You know what I mean? It's duck season, and I got better things to do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not waiting three hours now. I've been to Arthur Bryant's. Have you been to Arthur Bryant's, Kansas City? Yes. The burn ins are really good. I thought their thing else was just about like any other barbecue joint. Yeah. You know, I try to stay, I try to really do my research when I'm going to towns, uh, especially cities that I've never been to. Uh, I try to eat in new places um, every time I go to these cities. Whether I've gone to them one, you know, one time it's my first time, or whether I've been five times, try to find different things. I really work hard and find research. I've been to Arthur Bryant's, and the more I eat at these institutional places, right. the more I'm like, I don't need to keep going to these institutional places. They they tend to let me down more than I'm. They're built up too much hop. <clears throat> yeah, and they rest on their traditions and laurels, and they never evolve, and people's palates evolve, and they change, and I don't know. I can piss yeah. off all the barbecue people right here. If you go to Arthur Bryant's or you go to Rendezvous, you might as well go to Famous Dave's Barbecue because it's the same shit. You know, I think I think the most people that go to Arthur Bryant's and Rendezvous are from out of town. They mm-hmm. just they're just like you and want to yep. try it. And, and but, locals, I I I know a lot of folks from Kansas City, and I bet you most of them have been to Arthur Bryant's once or when right. they were a kid, and now they go to Slap, so they'll go to. You know, um, Oklahoma Joe's or whatever it's Oklahoma called. Oklahoma Joe's is delicious. Yeah. I love Oklahoma Joe's. But that's, see, that's me. I'd rather go to the regular places. Yeah. One of the best meals I ever had in my life was at Nicollet Square in Minneapolis. And we went to a cafe there. And I think it was the key cafe 25 years ago. I had meatloaf. One of the best meals I've ever had in my entire life. I went there twice on that trip because it was so good. It was excellent. I've never been there since. But it was really, really good. But it was not no. It was just a place we stopped for some reason to eat one day, and we went again the second day. It was really good. Meatloaf. You don't hear a lot of people no. saying, God damn, best damn. <laughs> no. But I like, I like meatloaf. <laughs> yeah, I do too. I do too. Oh, like a meatball, it actually, you know, <clears throat> you can't just phone it in. You can, and it'll just be like your mom's meatloaf that was maybe dry or unseasoned or so on. But like a good meatloaf, there's a science to that. Just like there is making good sausage, a good boudin, or a good barbecue. A good home cake cooked Aunt B meal is hard to beat if someone knows what they're doing and they cook good. Amen to that. The boys from New York that are here right now, they have the uh, Patsy's Pizzeria that we ate at when we were up in New York City, and they have the cheese stick egg rolls. Better is as good a cheese steak as Gino's was. It was mm-hmm. very good cheese steak. Philadelphia, but it's really good. But it's meat and cheese and good ingredients, and it's an egg roll, and it was excellent. And it's little things like that that I like more than the – yeah. I've never been to Peter Luger's. You lived in New York. Did you eat at Peter Luger's? I have. Is the steak as good as everybody says, or is it just? It a- is. No, it's it's good. It's, it, is- it 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 is. It's a it's a really it's a really good steak. It's a really good place. You feel like you're in the right spot. It's got right. all the feels to it. Um, 
you know, I'm not a big fan of their sides. I gotta have like good sides when I go to a steakhouse. They have cream spinach, I bet. They do. They have all your com- they have the you know your, your all your common stuff. But uh, you know, a lot of people like their prime rib. I'm not well. a prime rib. I, I mean, I eat it, but I'd rather have a steak. I know. I, I I agree. There's some prime rib purists out there. I'm like, oh, it's just like too wet for me. Yes. Right. You know, I need some. Yeah. I need some grill. Some some my artery action in there. You yeah. Know? I want a little crunch on it. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. what that. That's the the best part to a prime rib is the very end. Like, yeah, because it's got butt. that it's got that in and it's got the crunchiness to it and it's got all the seasoning on it. Um, but yeah, I'd rather have a regular steak than and their steaks than a broiled, primary. right? Yes, I believe so. And they do it on those hot plates, those sizzling plates. So yes. when you come out, it's like all oh. and it's cut already. Now right? is that is that butter that's on the bottom of it that they that they get really hot and kind of boil the shit? Yeah, in? I think it's clarified butter that they kind of like finish it off in that when on that hot plate. It looks. It, I want to go there one time when they've had it. They also have a tomato salad there that looks really good. I didn't get that. Now, I'm going to go there. We're going to eat. Their, we're, their hamburger is exceptional. I'm not going to Peter Eager's to eat a damn hamburger though. But, but I mean, you, you can have it. You can know you can have your cake and eat it too. Go yeah. for lunch, get the cheeseburger, and get everything else with it. You well, know? I want. We're going to go there. We were going to go there this last time, and we ended up eating at uh, pizzeria instead. And I was glad we did. But I'm going to go to Peter Eager's one day. But. They had some COVID rules that I wasn't going to go by, so I'm not going to those shit. Well, that's them. New, yeah. They probably New York City yeah. shit. But um, Keen Steakhouse is also really, really good. It used to be an old men's um, like back in the day before it was a steakhouse, or maybe they served steak at that time and so on. And I might have my history somewhat uh, wrong here, but from what I understand, it was a men's club back in the day where you'd go and get away from you know the family, go, and they have a a collection of pipes from all the the people that were in the club throughout you know, a century, mm-hmm. uh, hanging on all the walls and a bunch of taxidermy and stuff like that. It's in more in Midtown Manhattan where Peter Luger's is in Brooklyn. And, uh, is it, it is an, also an exceptional steak and they're really known for mutton chops, which is, you know, old lamb, mm-hmm. L, you know, a, kind of an older, uh, lamb that hadn't been harvested. Um, and that's what they're famous for mutton chops and also all their steaks and so on. It's a, it's a really cool scene. Would you order mutton chops, Andy? Yeah, I do. Uh, there's a place in Abilene that I order them from, um, Fuck, I can't remember the name right now. Beehive. Uh, no, not the Beehive. Uh, Taylor County Tap House. They have mutton chops, and they're really, really good. They serve them with Brussels sprouts and like a balsamic type glaze. Mm. It's good. Yeah. I'm not I a like mut- it. I'm not a mutton. I'm, I'm not a big game eater though. This is this, I mean, this is the right amount. I mean, it's good. Yeah, it's got the right amount of funk right, to it right. without being it's not too funky, but it's not a steak. You know, it's definitely not a steak. You right. eating, yeah. are you eating pull dues much? Yeah. Oh yeah. My dad would eat pullers. Love the gizzards on them. It's the best, best gizzards in the best, world. Best gizzard in water. That's what my dad would say too all the time. <laughs> well, I love them gizzards and pull dudes. Why? I what guess makes them just, so good. They're, they're big. big. Oh, yeah. Right. They're just bigger. They are for whatever reason. I don't. You know, that's something to get like uh, somebody from Ducks and Lemons to talk about. Like why what? they're so big? Yeah. What makes the just the way the animal is? Yeah. I now, guess. now this is a fun fact. It has nothing to do with anything. Just interesting to me. You and Stell Cracker went to elementary together, right? We went to. Um, yeah, we went to elementary and high school together. He's a year older than me. That, that's nuts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Two of the most famous Kunas chefs there are right now. There's there's you and him and Chef John, Dom Perdon. What's the guy's name? Paul Perdon. Paul Perdon. Yep, he's, he's third he's, now. He's passed. Well, also. that's why he's third now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my uncle yeah. lived in New Orleans forty years ago, and his court his company moved him down there, and he was a. Big big shot some company, but he would go into his restaurant and eat redfish all the time. Yeah, the the where Black and Redfish was founded at K Paul's uh, K Paul's restaurant. The myth the the story is that um, I don't know, may, am I telling this story to somebody that already knows? I don't know. The Not story me. the story is that um, um, one of Chef Paul's grill cooks, who was a who was a black guy who worked with him all his life, used to take catfish and make his lunch by putting a bunch of seasoning on this catfish and putting it on the grill and burning it and, you know, basically burning it, air quotes here, um, and and then eating it. And one time, Paul kind of saw that, tasted it, liked it, did it with redfish, and boom, there you go, everything But black. that's how it started. It. I knew he started the craze, but that's how. Yep. So his, a black guy there his, done it, and they called it black because and, and it was burned looking. Yep. And, yep. Well, I lo- I'll tell you what, I had that the other night at True Locks and Saint like, I love redfish. Isn't there a blackened. seasoning now, like a blackening seasoning? Yeah, like a I lot mean, of them. Yeah, there is a lot of them. And Paul Carrit had his whole line of seasoning, and and, um, and his his blackening one, I believe, was called Redfish Magic, and that was that was, was his blackening season. 
And uh, yeah, that that was in the 80s. It also contributed to the downfall of the the redfish yeah, populations in Louisiana. Yeah, crazy. Which and is why everybody still wanted regula- it. Yep, because they really? were overfished, and now that's why they're still regu- heavily regulated. It used to be just a red drum. Nobody cared that much about mm-hmm. them. And then after that, it was the craze. Now, let me ask you, I like the redfish on what they call that on, on the half shell. On the half shell. That's right. You tell Andy how he can make me one because Andy's the cook in the family. So if I catch some redfish and I haven't filleted with. What do you do? Just cook it one side. Yeah, got to make sure to keep the scales on. Uh-huh. That's the, that's what makes it all. That's what it makes it all pop. Um, I like to kind of just marinate it a little bit. Like I'm talking maybe for like two hours, get a little Italian dressing or something like that. Just smear it on top. Let it sit in the fridge, and then from there, it's pretty easy. You get a you get a grill or a smoker, and um, you can go kind of offset from the coals mm-hmm. and just let it kind of cook on the coals now i do like to make like a butter with it um so i I would i would maybe melt however much butter you like use some seasoning that you like it could be redfish magic like one of paul Bredones or slappy mama or or something local to here to texas and melt that in the butter make like this really seasoned butter sauce and as that redfish cook just keep kind of basting in that butter and once you know once that fish is cooked through you can just flake or scrape that meat out of the shell that that redfish mm-hmm. happens. So for those listeners who wonder what the fish don't have shells, what are you talking about? The redfish scales are like gnarly thick and hard. So when you leave them on, it creates kind of a bowl effect for that for that meat to cook in. And as that meat cooks, the juices just keep in that shell, keeping that meat meat nice and moist. Uh, and then when you're putting it on the pit or the grill, all that butter captures all that you know, smoky flavor and so on and so forth and just gives that redfish a very unique flavor right. by cooking it in it's the It's the best, best fish there is. I love yeah. that. I eat it everywhere we go that has mm-hmm. redfish, blackened redfish 100%. on the grill. I love you can, it. You can do that with other types of drum, like black drum. Um, even I've done it with sheep's head before. I've done it with uh, red snapper before. Uh, You've so, done sheep's head that way, huh? Yep. i never heard of that before either. Yep. How do you and do that? Same way. Just keep really? the scales on. You hmm. know, fillet it, keep the scales on. And, uh, you know, doesn't have the same, like, same with snapper. Snapper have much finer, um, much finer scales, smaller scales, but the same, is, the premise is the same. Can you do swordfish that way or is it too thick? Oh, I think swordfish uh, is probably too thick, but, man, what a great fish to put on the grill and smoke. Love it. That's one of my favorite saltwater fish, Steve. I want to go back to barbecue real quick. Would do, when you were working uh, in the restaurant, would you do the paper – on, on like your brisket and stuff, or would you do like the Texas crutch and use foil? We did Texas crutches. Um, and one of the big reasons for that is in New York, see, unlike Texas, where it is, you know, praised to run out of food, mm-hmm. um, in New York, that's that's just unacceptable. People want to come in at 8 or 9 o'clock in the, in the <laughs> at night and eat barbecue. And so I find the Texas crutches gives me a little more forgiveness with moisture content because... It doesn't. Um, it doesn't evaporate like the you know, uh, moisture doesn't evaporate. It doesn't get soaked into the paper. It really creates this more moist environment um, package. So at the restaurant, we we went with Texas Crutch because we knew we needed to keep barbecue for a longer period of time and not run out. So we did everything we could to just keep that moisture um, in there. Can I've you, done paper a couple times and I have failed miserably every single time. It's it's a completely different overdone yeah. every time. Dry. Uh, mm. there was one time, like it was even like as hard as a rock, like this table right here. And I don't know what happened. Can you imagine being that person that's got that restaurant that they sell out all their shit at 10 o'clock in the morning every day? That would be the greatest <laughs> thing in the world. Well, we talked the other last night. They don't, they're not open seven days a week. Well, no, but there are some places out there, yeah. all different foods that are done. You, they're done 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. They're finished. Whatever they got for the day. They're done. And it, I thought, man, that's the kind of restaurant to have. It's a great business model to create that type of demand where everybody that comes knows that you're going to be out by noon, one o'clock, you know? And, um, you know, I think that's the only way like barbecue restaurants can really survive and be profitable mm-hmm. because you can't serve leftover barbecue. It's expensive enough as it is. Right. Right. So like you got to make sure you're making every little piece of meat that you cook count. Um, and getting paid for that again, like there's not a lot of margin for error there. I mean, when you get a brisket, let's say you get an 18 pound brisket, you're trimming 30, 40% of the weight off mm-hmm. right there. Then you lose another 40% of the weight just by cooking. So if you're paying, 
I don't know what the cost of brisket is right now. I would guess five ninety five, six ninety five a pound. Yes. Right. Like you're losing thirty percent off the top. You're losing thirty percent off off the cook, and now you're left at something that costs closer to twelve, fourteen dollars a pound. Might as well be serving about, them ribeyes. I didn't think about that. Like, because you're going to trim why, it down. Yeah, which is why a lot of brisket costs how much a pound? Twenty five dollars a pound. Yeah. You know, twenty eight. Right. Yeah. So yeah. They, they need to not. They need to. They need to run out because what you're going to do with the leftover bar, you put in your beans, put in your collard greens. Yes, that's an outlet for it. But if you always have barbecue, right. then you're just you're not going to sell enough size to always move the leftover stuff. And any any barbecue place worth their chops is cooking fresh every day, no matter what. Right. Bucky's the other day, you know, they do the brisket sandwiches now, chopped or sliced. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize this, but they haul our fresh briskets out and they carry it out there. And these people flock around this shit. We were at Bucky's on Black Friday. Stop there. Couldn't figure out what the hell was going on. I thought, Jesus Christ, Michelle had Michelle had to pee. They have the nicest bathrooms in the world. They do. And I knew if she went in there, she's gonna buy shit. She always buy, spends a lot of money. So I was gonna park. There was no way to park in the back of the parking lot, three rows deep. And that place was packed. It was like Walmart would have been on Black Friday. But they had chopped brisket sandwiches, seven ninety nine a sandwich. Damn good deal. And we're, and it was good, and it's good barbecue. Yeah. It's not nothing famous. It's yeah. but it was a good same yep. thing you're gonna get at Arthur Bryant's. Probably use rotisserie barbecue pits to where you know I not have. not offsets like a lot of like Texas places where you have to man it. Right. You don't think uh, that they're getting it? They're just thawing, or cooking it in the oven. It's already been cooked. Maybe, maybe they're getting. Maybe they have a commissary where they smoke it, pack it, come in. And I so would on. figure as many as them stores as they have. They have one Bucky's outside of Texas. It's in Alabama. I stopped there. <laughs> um, I stopped there a year ago. Oh, I stopped there on the way to go turkey hunting. When I was going, I was going to shoot my first turkey. as Osceola. I stopped in Alabama. I was like, "Is it by Mobile somewhere down there?" Yeah, it's um, man, I forget exactly where it was. The exit is called Bucky's Boulevard. Mm -hmm. It is the and I asked, I was I was blown away how many people were there. There was a line to get in, <laughs> and there was a line to get out. Yeah, it took me forty five minutes. To get Jesus. out of the parking lot. Out of Bucky's. Out of Bucky's. I went, got gas. I stopped because I just needed, I was like, oh, wow, there's, there's a Bucky's outside of Texas. Didn't know that. I had right. to stop. So I stopped. And um, I was talking to the cash register, the the, the lady working behind the, the, the cash. And I said, man, y'all are. Athens, I mean, Alabama. Athens, Alabama. Has one. I said, y'all are just incredibly busy. I mean, and she said, this is the, this is the busiest Bucky's in the lineup. Is in that in that spot now? Oh, shit, I, said, I could not. I mean, and I, like like the infrastructure to get in and out of the place. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. They, they just didn't. Whoever created those <laughs> were just didn't. <laughs> they, they didn't think they didn't about. They didn't think it was going to be that popular, I guess. Because I tell, I am not exaggerating. It took me forty five minutes just from so. the time I left my gas pump mm -hmm. to get on back on the inter, on the interstate. The one in Dallas. Is oh pretty, no, they've pretty, got a bunch of them now. They got Athens, Alabama, Leeds, Alabama, Loxley, Alabama, Daytona Beach. St. Augustine, really? Calhoun, Georgia, Warner Robins, Georgia, Richmond, Kentucky, Florence, South Carolina, Crossville, Tennessee. That's just Alvin, good business on their part. Angleton, they see that everywhere Angleton, they Angleton. open, really? they crush it. So, like, why would they not just become? I thought that was the only the one Walmart. outside of. Outside uh, I think of it was, but I think that they're doing so well. Just kidding. everybody the, goes to them. The guy, like, get, the guy that owns them gave fifty million dollars to Texas A and M. I think. I know some folks in the um, in the. Uh, Grocery business, you know, traditional grocery. Right. They are scared shitless of, of Bucky's. Bucky's. Yeah. They've got everything. And they pay their employees really good, too. Like, they're starting people out $18 to $20 an hour on their board. Well, if you're going to work at Walmart. Cheapest gas around. Yeah. Yes. I don't, right. I'm not a gas price guy because I got to buy the shit. So when it's time for me to buy gas, am I going to haggle with a guy over $30 or over 30 cents and not get gas? No. I had a buddy of mine that did that shit and ran out one time. I ain't paying that much. There's principal to the thing. Well, fucking walk. And he did. Mm -hmm. But so, but I don't know. I, I'm assuming they're gas cheap. They got 200 pumps. How many if places I, have 200 pumps? If I'm, I, I may be wrong here, uh, but I feel like I've, I've heard that they are actually, they actually lose money on gas. On gas. Because they know what they bring in for being the, right. the cheapest around. Oh, it's, it's, like, just, it's like a six pack of Cokes would be 99 cents at a grocery store. Mm -hmm. They'd lose the money, but they'd get you in because you're not going to yeah. just buy Cokes. You're going to buy right. chips. That's right. You yeah, because nobody stops in Bucky's and just gets gas. I, no. Like a lot of places, I stop and get gas. I don't even go inside and I got to pee. Yeah. But I'll go into Bucky's every time and buy shit I don't need. You're right about that. You started on a uh, weird base for, for turkeys, starting with the Osceola. Like that's bass backwards from everything that I've <laughs> ever heard about turkey on. Unless you're from yeah. Florida. Unless yeah. you're from Florida. Like. Yeah. That was my first turkey. 
Um, actually, we we cooked it for Thanksgiving this year. Shared oh, it, really? shared it with my in laws uh, and and stuff. My family fried it up. Oh, that's the and, way I gotta go. tell you. It, it was probably I was. I told everybody I was like, make sure y'all get this this sugar ham because yeah. I don't know how this turkey's gonna <laughs> come out. Uh, you know, um, and it was it was probably the best fried turkey I've ever made. Um, now the legs. A little. I, well, like I, I separated, tried to cook them separately because I knew they 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 weren't going to cook at the same rate as the breast. Right. And I, I would I need to do over on my leg my leg portion, but the breast portion, man, it was it was fire. Speaking of stale cracker, you know I find that it, his his blend his um um, um two step um uh, makes for a heck of a turkey injection when combined with like turkey stock mm-hmm. butter in his two step is a is a hell of an injection. Did you did the on a, on like a wild bird? I've noticed like there's a lot of tendons in those legs. Did you see that like when you did yours? Um yeah um. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it's actually more or less than a domestic bird. We used to cook a lot of like Disneyland style smoked right. drums yeah. at, at the restaurant. And we would have to go and, and tweezer those things. Like, Oh, you would do that before? After. Oh, after. after. It's cooked. Like come take it out once it's cooked. You kind of pluck them out, then wrap them, then, then right. hold them warm. Um, but yeah, look, they're, they're athletes, right? Like those, sure. those, those wild birds. Are, are athletes and their legs get the mm-hmm. get get pumping you got to really treat them right uh and next time i do it I, I won't fry the legs at all i'll just like cook them in like a braise and mm-hmm. have and kind of be nice and soft and they're very moist and they need a lot of time and a lot of moisture to keep it one thing the last turkey that i did i didn't know that you could separate the skin from the muscle and I pushed, uh, I got, I got like softened butter and I like, I separated the skin from the muscle and then I just lined that little sack that you make with butter, lined it. And then I threw it on the Traeger and smoked it. And then I kept, and then I put it in, uh, put it in like a, a tin fo- a foil pan mm-hmm. and I just kept pouring butter over it and yeah. like all that butter would just go to the bottom. Well, then I shredded it or no, I can't remember how I did it. It doesn't matter. Served it for sure. Anyway. I'd cut everything up in that pan and it just had all that butter and the drippings and everything. And it turned out delicious. Fucking delicious. It was, it was, it was insane. Yeah. Butter and Turkey, even like the barbecue guys that do Turkey really well, that's what they swear by. Just butter. Like, well, butter is what helps just give that, give it all that moisture during that cook. Yeah. Cause even my, my, uh, my mother-in-law, she hates, uh, like white meat. She's she's a dark meat lady, chicken, Turkey. It doesn't matter. And like she swore by, like she said, that's the best turkey breast I've ever had. So I'm gonna do it that way every time. See, now. I think I'm next year. I'm going to smoke and fry my turkey. I think I'm gonna smoke How it. How do you do that? Yeah, I think. Well, we used to do this a lot with chicken wings, right? You smoke them, then fry them to order. I think that's what I'm gonna try to do next year. I'm gonna take it like to 160 degrees, mm-hmm. um, cool it. And then pop it in the fryer and just to crisp the skin. It's yeah. a little bit of a gamble. I've seen it done on on the interweb. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know like it can work from a from a technique kind of thing, but you know, because um, I do like a good smoked turkey. But right. I kind of want every. I kind of want you want all the I flavors. Want it all, right. You know? Yeah. I did look up. Bucky's got sued because their gas was too cheap. Uh, they were selling gas for one seventy nine, but they paid one ninety. You're making a lot of money if you're giving up 11 cents a gallon as much gas as they sell in a day. Yes. I mean, they're giving up a lot of money. <laughs> so, yeah, and then I guess one of the competitors sued them because it was like, listen, this you know, is not fair. Okay, I'm going to give this to the... I'm, I'm not a How Je- can you get sued for that? That's what I'm saying. I'm not a Jeff Bezos fan at all. I think Amazon is horrible for America for small businesses. But if he didn't have such a good product that people could sign they weren't people wouldn't be buying shit like they do the market has I buy, decided I buy that, from amazon all the time right the market has yep. decided that jeff bezos is where he is yes nobody S- else did like S- the market did cisco loses to uh, jeff bezos in my family because when i need paper plates now i don't go to cisco i get them from amazon because i can get better quality and i can get them cheaper hmm. we order a lot of stuff all of our cleaning products at the lodge and stuff come from cisco come from amazon it's the same price i pay in town at a grocery store but I don't have to go get them. They yeah. come right. They deliver it to me. So Jeff Bezos done something the American public wanted, just like Sam Walton did in 1972 when he started Walmart or 68 or whenever they started. 
Bucky's is doing the same thing. If Bucky's has got 40 stores now, in 10 years, there's going to be 300 of them things in every metropolitan area in the world that's got a place because you get a clean restroom, you get cheap fuel, and you got anything you want to buy to eat in there. Mm-hmm. Plus, you can buy a Yeti cooler. You can buy a painting. We a have a smoker. Damn, yeah, <laughs> fire pit. Yes, chairs. Yeah. We have a damn cow painting in my house. My wife bought it. Bucky's. We have Terry Redlands. We have Les Cubas in our house. And we got a cow <laughs> cramp from Bucky's. fucking Bucky's. Well, that's my point about grocers being scared to death of Bucky's. Yes. Taking up big market share right. um, from places like that. Because they know it's only a matter of time till fresh stuff gets into that. Yes. To those places. You know? Yeah. And when that's start, really the difference, right? When they start selling fresh meat and fresh produce, it's mm-hmm. over. Yeah. And 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 they probably got to worry about it. like the what Maddie say, if if Dollar General sold steaks, I wouldn't I have would, no reason would, to go anywhere else. Go anywhere else. But then there's there's this side of me that thinks like they have to do a balancing act because part of them are a little bit of a novelty to where when people see one, they're like, Oh, I don't I gotta stop at Bucky's because I've never mm. been to a Bucky's. If they have a bunch of them everywhere, it's going to lose that. In my mind, it might lose that. Uh, you didn't see them people Christmas shopping in there, huh? The people were Christmas shopping in there. I mean, they had they were right, Christmas. But how Black many Friday. people go into Bucky's just because it's Bucky's and they've never seen Bucky's? I don't think. I I'm think people stop in there because they like the All shit the in time? there. I think there's. Lo- I think if you lived by Bucky's, there's. Do you have Bucky's close to you? Mm-mm. I mm-hmm. think the people that live close to Bucky's go there a lot. Bay they town. may not always go in ta- inside, but they stop and get gas. But they like, hey, I want some fudge, I want some nuggets or whatever they call them shit. I think there's <laughs> yeah. some. I think there's some regulars that go there. Beaver nuggets, yeah. <laughs> I think there's people that go in there all the time. Well, they also beat you over the head with billboards. Yes, yes. I mean, on yeah. my way here, it started at 113 miles from Bucky's, <laughs> yeah. and I swear, like every five miles, there was like, "Get your sliced brisket, <laughs> get your clean bathrooms, come get some beaver nugs." Yeah. And I was like, "It's only been 15 miles, yeah. guys. I still right. have 87 yeah. miles to go." Okay, I get it. I'm going to Bucky's, right? But I, got- but I want the sweet tea and nugs. <laughs> what do you think that it helps the big Texan steakhouse? Because me and Andy were making fun of this the other day. You're some. You're right outside of Dallas Fort Worth. You just left a. Dallas Forest got some of the finest eating establishments in America, like all big cities do. Mm-hmm. And there's a sign, 312 miles ahead, the Big Texan Steakhouse, the 72 ounce, all you can eat, eat for free, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. They're everywhere on that deal. And what a tourist trap that yeah, is. Yeah, I've been there three times. I've had breakfast. Their breakfast is very good. I don't think their dinners are very good. I think their steak's way overrated. Mm-hmm. But who the hell can eat a 72 ounce steak anyways? I was tempted one time. I stopped, I've been there one time. It was right when I was living in California. I was making the trip back, and I like to take. I, I was taking different routes, so I went through Amarillo, then cut across, and I stopped there. And you know, they have like the table yep. that is elevated mm-hmm. for those folks to do it. But it's not just the steak, right? It's like it's a twelve potato. pound potato. Twelve. Yeah, <laughs> it's like yeah, so much potato. Then all you know, a shrimp cocktail also included. I did. I did eat a steak there again. wasn't wasn't impressed. No. But I needed. I needed to go there. But it was to 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 your point about institutions. Like you, there's a when you go to a place for the first time, you feel like you have to see like, you know, those restaurants or those tourist attractions that made this place what it is. But then after that, I don't need to go back. You know, right. um, when yeah. you when you see that seventy two pound ounce roast sitting there that they're going to try to serve you as a steak. And then some lady, some lady weighed 115 pounds the other day. I had it in 24 minutes or something. I saw she had it in 24 minutes. I don't know how the hell where she put it at even. But when you see that big old thing, and then they give you the shrimp cocktail. Now, if you go in there and you order a shrimp cocktail, they're not giving you those big 16, 20 count shrimps. They're giving them little cheap Brazilian shrimps. They give you a big old shrimp, and you got to eat the roll. It's terrible. Dude, I don't I know how anybody does it. Just thinking about. Oh, it right I don't now. know how anybody could do that stuff. 72 just, ounces. Yes, and it says yeah, 20 minutes. She ate in 20 minutes, and she's pretty good-looking gal if it's a gal I saw. That's just, that's just above four pounds, huh? Yeah. And she weighed 115 or 20 pounds. I'm assuming she had to eat all of that. Yes, yeah, she did. That's all that comes with it. Oh, she's Asian. Yeah. Oh, does that how. make you a big eater? Well, Dude, they, they do the they hot dogs. the best appetites. Right. Dude, I, I, am, I am friends with a number of Asian men and women who love to eat, who keep up with me in eating. And I think it's a cultural thing. I just They just... They live and love the dinner table. How can you? She look at her though. She ate two of them back to back. She did the first one in twenty six minutes, and she did the second one in thirty four thirty. This year again. Too. Identifies professional competitive eater. That is her. I mean, if you saw her at I mean, a bar somewhere, Asian, and she's she no, said, she's definitely Asian. Oh, we're being 100%. racist here. I, I, That's I, oriental. I mean, she is. I she's, can't say that. I don't, I don't think. Look at that. That's, 
I don't understand why that's a bad word. Look at the steak. Look at the you got a you got the roll. You got to do that. It looks like two potatoes over there. Well, she ate two of them. But you have to do two potatoes with no, each. Uh, no, she did. No, no, that's two. But I'm those saying are two that's settings. two portions. That's what's two this, portions. What's this right here? Is that so you have to have two salads too. You got to be healthy. If oh, you're that eat is that. that is that's a salad there. That's a salad there. There's her two potatoes. Kind of my, and I, I think my the fried IBS shrimp just kicked in. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine that? Imagine she, I bet she tore up grandma's toilet oh, like Thanksgiving Day, boy. Woo. She dropped it. I'm pretty sure, like those hot dogs, the guys who eat the hot dogs, like uh, J- Jimmy Chestnut, what's his name? Tommy yeah, Chestnut. Joey Chestnut. Joey Chestnut. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I've talked to a couple of professional eaters. Like they have to keep it down till they, and then they go and purge themselves and throw it all. Ha- there's no oh, way you can eat that much. To. But 140, can you imagine 144 ounces of raw meat coming out of her? Oof. Oh. That sounded horrible. <laughs> I was just, I just smirked. That, so like, didn't, that didn't sound right. <laughs> but I mean, it's just. Have you, when you lived in New York, did you ever go over to like Coney Island and look at any of that, uh, the contests that they have? Yeah. You know, right when I got to New York, I went to Coney Island. And right when we left, we went to Coney Island because we were trying to <clears throat> just take in all the tourist stuff that we didn't do together, my wife and I, that is. Um, Coney Island's a cool place, man. She don't let Michelle hear this. Why? Because she wanted to go last time we were there, and I was like, we ain't got time for that. We, we went to the Amityville house. We ain't got time to go yeah. to Coney Island also. Coney Island. She wants a, to see it. Yeah, it's big Russian population. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's some really cool things happening right there. Uh, Spumoni Gardens, one of the best pizzas. Uh, Grandma Slices that you'll ever have is there. Um, and then, you know, the, the whole atmosphere of the rides and the... And the um, theme park and having the beach right there, it's super cool. Um, it's just, you know, a lot of those places, a lot of, a lot of these places in New York that just have this, this vibe that you can't find anywhere else. That's that's Coney Island, you know. And if obviously, like it gets, there's a lot of, you know, Nathan's hot dogs and mm-hmm. there's a lot of commercialized things and tourist traps and little chotskis on the boardwalk and so on, but. You know, there's again, there's still like that big Eastern European, Russian, Ukrainian population that lives in that area, and they have their thumbprint on that thing too. It doesn't get you don't see that during the hot dog eating contest, right? But it's there when you go in person. Did you have you ever been to uh, Atlantic City? No, never been to Atlantic we, City. We went to Atlantic City, and then we went to Cape May, New Jersey. And Cape May is a really cool place. I've been to Cape May. That is a cool. The architecture there is a, probably the coolest architecture of anywhere I've been in the United States. All them old houses. There's a lot of history on the East Coast. I mean, mm-hmm. you think about where we landed and kind of settled right. in that area of Virginia, then it kind of spread out north and south. Um, there's there's a lot of history, and a lot of people do a lot of work to preserve that history, and not get it commercialized and t- buildings torn down for bigger, um, you know, six, seven, eight story walk-ups to fit as many people as you can. That's, they could, they could do a show in Cape May of like the 1910s hmm. and just put some old cars on the street. Cause it still looks that way. Cause all them old homes. I feel like boardwalk empire was filmed a lot in Cape. That May. was a cool, that was a very good show. Yeah. Very good. Very, very good show. That guy's a great actor. Yeah. He's dead now, isn't he? Steve Buscemi. No. Is he? No, is he still alive? So. Well, he's a great actor. You yeah. who'd you kill off the other day? You killed off Michael J. Fox the other day. Alan Jackson last night when we got home. I told yeah. Michelle, I said Alan Jackson died. She goes, oh. And then I read a deal and it said Alan Jackson's death is fake. So okay. Yeah. Well, if you did Michael J. Fox the other day. Like, yeah, he's dead. I'm like, no, yeah. he just did. He just did he Back good, to the Future. He hasn't made good shows in a long time. So, well, he got Parkinson's. Yes. Jeff, he's kind of preoccupied. Yeah. Where Where are the customers harder at? East Coast or West Coast? Like as a as a as a chef. Are you more like Southern oh, Louisiana? Oh no, uh, I would say I would say East Coast, East Coast, East Coast. You're New Yorkers get. have, um, and there's something there's kind of like this island feel about the West Coast that mm-hmm. everybody's just like ah, you know, maybe right. it's the pot, maybe it's I don't know, <laughs> maybe it's the weather, who knows? Um, but the but the East East Coast, you know, just a little bit more chip on their shoulder. Uh, mm-hmm. expectations of, of the standard of especially in the restaurant business is much higher than in most places and so and, you know a lot of people in the east coast whether you're from there or not from there um especially in new york you've you've traveled around you've eaten in a lot of different places and so when you come home you kind of look into you know that same standard and the same the restaurant I, I would have maybe it's because i spent 12 years in new york that i'm saying that and only about two three years on the west coast um, but it's just something about New Yorkers. They're not assholes about it, but, and there's something that makes you better 
as a professional mm-hmm. as well, having those people around because as their expectations and standards, when they come into the restaurant, like your job is to ex- exceed those expectations, right? Not just meet them, but exceed them. And uh, that, that pushes you, your creative creativity, your hospitality, your, you know, um, your ability to be flexible and athletic and, and, you know, in the heat of the moment that just makes you a better, at least as it comes to a chef, I think it kind of sharpens, sharpens that blade a little bit. You if, know? You, if you could pick, you've been all over the United States. If you could pick anywhere else in the U S to go on, to hang out for five days, to just eat and be a local, where would you go to? <sighs> Man, I have probably say Charleston because, um, and that, and that's, that's, that's an answer that a lot of people would give these days. Charleston. Yep. Um, South Carolina. Yep. Um, and um, I was I say that because I love the beach. I love the beaches are clean there. Yep. I love the beach. I love the southern feel, and they have great restaurants. And they really focus on being local, and especially in their seafood, which they have a great seafood culture there. Um, What's the name of that place we ate there? Do you remember? Something moose, the blue moose or something. I can't remember. It had like the duck fries or something like yeah. that for five days. I, I and and I just want to like go to the beach and wine and dine and and see some cool sights. Oh, Charles is hard to beat, you know. Um, but I, you know, I, we we kind of we kind of mouthed off on Austin the other day. Mm-hmm. You know, Austin. If Austin had a beach, it'd be pretty darn close <laughs> to Charleston. You know, minus all the minus all the homeless people. If but. Texas had asshole, it'd be in Austin. <laughs> The tattooed moose. The tattooed moose is where we ate it. I right? need to, I'm going to have to talk because my wife has taken her, my mother in law to Charleston this summer. So I'm going to have to get some restaurants from you. I, I whoa, got, whoa, whoa, hold yeah. on. She's taking her mother in law? Mm-hmm. You should take me somewhere. Jeff, that'd be cool. I do, I do enough for you. <laughs> so I do enough. Charleston is a cool place. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's, I like, I like Tampa Bay as well. I think Tampa's, Tampa. I think Tampa's a really cool up and coming, um, Florida town. I don't understand why there's not more towns in Florida like like a Charleston or like a Austin. They just seem to be behind when it comes to especially their their food scene and and maybe that has something to do with the demographic and so on. Because really the only food scene like of of an kind of on that caliber of Charleston or New York or Austin is in Miami. And um, but I feel like Tampa is 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 getting there. Love the beaches there. Great people and it just. You know, you want to see more creativity, kind of some of that younger generation come in and, and creating food two, in it. But two places I've been to that had really cool places, like you're talking about. First of all, one of them was Pensacola, Florida. They had a, 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 a yeah kind of a locals type area downtown that was really pretty cool. And we went to right across from Kittery, Maine, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. They had a downtown mm. area. We went to and ate a couple of nights. And it was right, which Portland, Maine is a foodie place. It right is. off the docks. It is great food. I mean, Maine in general has a great, great food scene. You mm-hmm. know, especially during the spring and some, you know, summer to late summer. After that, shit gets gnarly around there. <laughs> but, um, but I mean, look, look, you can eat lobster at every meal. You got my vote, man. And breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and I'm having a good time. And that's a good. I want to do lobster. I'm going to do that this off season. What are you going to do? Lobster rolls. They're good. Well, I know they are, but I'm going to do them myself, and they'll be really good. Well, we'll see. You screwed mm-hmm. up brisket pretty bad. I screw it up every time. Well, Brisket's everybody else hard. Is- somebody asked me last night. They're like, "What do you like? Like, you what do you dislike cooking?" I was like, "Brisket, mostly because I'm not good at cooking it." Right? You know, it's it's just a it's a it's a not an easy piece of meat to. to and know. I can do beef ribs. I love beef ribs, but my uh, the the brisket is no good. Did you do like your own uh, like pasta and stuff when you, when it came time to do pasta dish? Like you're rolling out, cutting it, and yeah. all that. The I, whole- make, I make my own pasta at home. Uh, when I worked at a restaurant called Maialino in New York City, we made our own pasta there, which is how I kind of started to understand that whole process. I love pasta making. It's, you do? Yeah. One, one of the best dishes I ever had was in New Orleans, and I can't remember the restaurant, but we I had veal Alfredo. It was very, very good. I never even heard of it before, hmm. but which I like veal anyways. Yeah. I love veal Parmesan. Love Parmesan. But, so, but, yeah. but it was veal Alfredo, like chicken alfredo or something to veal yeah. in it i had a i had parmesan in ely minnesota's a restaurant there that has uh walleye parmesan uh, that seems a little weird it's me. good it's good <laughs> it, it really does that's what i thought so too yeah. it was very good yeah i mean it, re- it was a really good meal and i would have never thought about having walleye parmesan my first time having walleye i was in um i was in the up upper peninsula michigan and was doing some doing an event with ford bronco 
and I got my hands on some walleye. Good fish. It's a very good fish. Yeah. I need to check your Ford Bronco out before you leave here. Yeah, I got to take a look at that. A Jeff look. was wanting Jeff was wanting one real bad. I want to know why you now. gave up on your dream. They're too small. Oh. I want a bigger Bronco. You want the, I want you the want old. The, oh, you want the V8. I want the big Bronco. Yeah. I want but I want I want Bronco and I want Chevy both. Like Michelle's got a full size Tahoe Jimmy or a Blazer to come back. I want them to come back and build one the way like the Tahoe. You could take the back of it off and stuff. I don't. The car dealers I don't understand. Cars today suck. They really do. They don't look good very long. You get the old classics, even the old yeah. box Chevy pickups and Ford pickups. They had character to them and stuff. One of these car companies, one of these engineers, gonna have to wake up one day and say, you know what? America wants a 1972 vehicle all over again. Muscle car looking everything. Bring me back the 1976 Trans Am. Think, but don't you think that people like the the Plymouth thing that they came out with? What is it? The um, they don't make them anymore. I think it was a huge flop, but it was built. It was um, a, um, I think I know what you're talking about. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. It's the old. They came out into as maybe in the early 2000s or late 90s. Early yeah. Yes. 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 Plymouth. Yes. I remember. And they were modeled after these old cars, and they completely failed and flopped every you, now and then you still see one on the road you yes. come up with a square a front end square chevy body. blazer 1986 and you put that same truck out today and they'd sell out but it wouldn't hit the emissions well, and it wouldn't do this well, but that's out, what people look, want have you seen the bronco heritage editions i have not seen one of the new broncos so that, their body styles are from the 60s i, I saw them, but they're small real small well, the two door and four door the one I saw was real small. I had one parked next to me at the airport the you're other day. You're talking about a sport, then. And you could put that some bitch in my Tahoe. Yeah, you're talking about a Bronco Sport. Yeah. You seen mine out there? Oh, I did see that today. I didn't know whose it was. That's, that's, a, that's a Bronco yeah. Raptor, though. So. Is it the green looking thing out there? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I said, boy, who's the fancy California boy out there wearing that <laughs> shit? They're making, they're, making the plate, fun, they're making fun of you in Louisiana. I'm telling you, when you drive, there's a old pretty boy right there. Is that it right there, that's the yellow that, one? That's, that's the Heritage, the red and the yellow. So they, they made so, a Heritage model. So see there, Jeff, it's got four doors. It does, it's not very freaking big, though. When you see it up front, you can put it under your arm and carry you it. You can go look at mine. It's the same. Mine's a little wider, but it's the same. The, the, it is that same. But, but you know what I'm talking about. You the like Broncos. the murder wagon is what you like, Jeff. I like the murder wagon that I drive, but it's a, but it's a full-size vehicle. I don't know why Ford don't come out with a Bronco that's the same one that OJ ran to the fucking ran away from the I cops. I bet that's. In. I bet the. I bet it's, it's the about, same yeah. dimension. No, it's not. I bet you it no, is. It's not check, close. check out the Plymouth Prowler. Plymouth Prowler. I think that's what it's called. Plymouth Prowler. But Tahoe still makes a full size fucking Tahoe. Yes. Like my wife's got one. It's no different than a Bronco. I think they'll. I think. I think Bronco. I think Ford will come out with a V8. They I hope they, they do. They said they haven't. They said they won't. But I think they will. Like well, I got the Z seventy one. Package with everything. So much run like a scalded ape. Is it that? That well, that's the you know the cry. Yeah. So <laughs> no, that's a pimp car right there, that dude. Is. Those came out in Chrysler Corporation. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. There you go. And 2000, 2002. They made them things in to shady. 2002. They made them in shady side. What do you think yeah, you're getting re- out of well, that? Well, remember when they brought those? Like, but well, my point is that you know. We keep thinking that, but do people really want to buy not it? Not that. Well, no, of course not that. <laughs> Pull up a 1976 Trans Am. That's what people want to have. People want to drive the Bandit's car again. I if don't you, think so. Oh, I'm telling you, would you rather drive that shit or would you drive the 1976 Trans Am? That's, 76 That's right, because it's cool as shit. <laughs> you can buy a 1976 Trans Am. You can buy a brand new one if they made them. Probably about fifty thousand dollars cheaper than the new one because I think them things are about seventy five to eighty thousand dollars. Oh, look at that black uh, bird! That is that wow. Is, that does look good. I'm telling you right now, my fat ass getting one of them suckers, boy. Turn on some Van Halen. Get in, but oh, can't get up, out. You know, like, we, grease me, grease me up on the chops. How much do you think these cost? I bet you you can't buy one that's in mint condition for under fifty grand. Huh. I, I uh, it's lost on me. I'd, I'm, I'd, I'm I'd pay fifty. Yet, I'd pay fifty grand for one of those. Really? Hell yeah, I would. But what about like the Mustang? No, the Shelby. Oh, those are nice. Too, Eleanor yeah. on on uh, yeah. Gone in sixty those seconds. Those probably are a hundred thousand plus. You think so? Yes. But you're, yeah, you're getting a better car though. I would take both of them. But that black car right Eleanor there. Eleanor is Eleanor. If I had, and make, I'm not a car guy. They it make an F one fifty Raptor Shelby. Oh really? It has like six hundred fifty horsepower or something yeah. like that. I just want one of the old cars. They're badass with the good tunes <laughs> in them. Right. On. See, Ollie's with me. He wants a Trans Am also. He'd ride in the back of that with me. Give me a Hurst shifter on it and get his, a barefoot floor uh, get gas his, paddle. Get his perm looking good. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> that would be that would be it right there. I mean, that's pretty sexy. That that is. That's the one. Eleanor. 
Eleanor from Gone in 60 Seconds. That's not Eleanor from well, Sigmund. That's, that's a newer one. But how much would you pay to have Nick Cage in the package, would you? A hundred, yeah. <laughs> that, None. That, He's a squirrely fucker. Oh no. <laughs> yes. No way. I like Nick Cage. Nick Cage is a good dude. Um let me look it up. Eleanor for sale. We'll just find we'll find You're probably out gonna right find now. Eleanor for sale <laughs> probably in a car. Oh yeah. <laughs> Andy. <laughs> My search history. Uh let's see. You're, it's right, hundred hundred k ninety nine. You know, get make give you a deal being under a hundred. That's fine. That's about. right. Yeah. So this one's ninety nine. It's in uh, Illinois, and then one thirty. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Hold on. Go up to the G's. top. Go to the top one. Was it a sixty seven? Yes. Okay. Both of them are sixty sevens. Built in two thousand nine. What does that that's, mean? That's not a new one. Then that's that one right there is the original. Which one? The one thirty? Yes, that's the original one. In Ontario, California. Yep. Hmm. That would be my car, though. Work up your tips, Andy. I'm telling you, <laughs> your wife would kick your ass. Your mother would expect me to come home with something like that, but your wife would. I'm never not going to come that. home with anything like that. No. I needed to hit that two billion dollar that turned into like six hundred million dollar lottery to even think about getting something like that. Um, I would have drove the Trans Am out here to work though. <clears throat> You wouldn't. Would. You would need to know if I'm coming because you would hear me coming because I would be 16 years old again. It's like we've said. Like if Jeff wins the lottery, he's not going to tell anybody, but there's going to be plenty of clues. Oh, lots of signs. <laughs> there will be the Trans Am is going to be one of those yep. that Jeff came into. And my tags are going to say "Don't beg." <laughs> God, there'd be a lot of happy people at Christmas time around me though because I would bless a lot of poor people in my life. Mm. Would I'd, you? Yeah. Oh, I would. Yes, I would. I would go to a lot of places where there were people buying uh, Christmases for their kids and pick up everything. Yep, I would do a lot. Of, I would blow my money, but it would go to a good cause. That's what Shaq does. Everywhere he goes, it just... Well, I would have had more money than Shaq, paid. so if he can afford to do it, I could. He's a good dude. I mean, anybody that goes to Walmart and buys kids' box and shit, yeah. that's, a, that's, a, that's a good person. Oh, shit, I got to play Santa Claus tonight, don't I? You do? No, it's Wednesday. I'm Santa Claus for Knox Kitty Kids. Oh, you can pull that off. I do. Off. I did last year. My grandkids were confused, boy. They didn't know at first. <laughs> Reese was kind of looking at me. He's like, Judge? <laughs> oh, 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 yes. We do the elf on the shelf, and my eight-year-old called me out the other day. He's Uh-oh. like, he found it two years ago, <laughs> and he still remembers. I thought he forgot. No. Kids I don't even know like what that means. Trap. Elf like, on the shelf. It's your you'll, you'll, marketing yes. genius. Come up with an idea that you're, you're a shitty parent if you don't have an elf on the shelf in your house. Every parent has to buy one. You're two years away from having an elf on the shelf. Yep. What it is, it's just an elf, and you move it every night. So the kid wakes up, and the elf is moved. He's got to go find. He's got to find the elf. Yeah. And well, so finding the elf is the is yeah, it's the just, outcome. It's, it's magical. Just, yeah, like the this uh, the story is the elf watches you all day and then reports back to Santa at night, and then in the uh, morning he's in a different spot because he's been to the North Pole and back. Mm. Well, and they'll give him mischievous stuff to do, like take some Christmas ornaments. Now we don't do by. all that. Oh, you shit. Don't? We just we we move them. Andy. We're not. Uh, Y'all don't have a lot of sense no. Here. Like there's, you can see like TikToks, like they got the elf on the shelf, like they got powdered sugar, like in lines, and he's snorting it, and they got Barbie, and she's. You Naked. can get as creative as you want. I don't do that. Um, I just move them. It's just sitting there. It's just sitting there. But so he leaves when Santa comes Christmas Eve night. I threw him in a drawer mm. and my, he was six, he was five or six <laughs> at the time <laughs> meddling, which like, listen, don't be digging uh, through our drawers in our bedroom. That's you're an really, electric ear cleaner. Yeah. You're really going to find some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he was like, what is, uh, he named him brother. Cause my wife was pregnant with, uh, his brother when we introduced Jameson. Elf on the shelf. This is your other kid's name is Jason. Yeah. So he's like, why is brother in the drawer? <laughs> I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I was like, you're kidding me. He where do you, you get that electric submarine Santa, at next to it? <laughs> Santa didn't Santa didn't take brother. He threw him in the drawers. Like, I played it off well, I thought. So the other night, you know, Christmas is coming. He's like, Dad. This kid's smart. smart. Tell me. I need you to tell me the truth. Like, oh, <laughs> okay. Did, did Santa really forget brother or did you just, you just put him somewhere, didn't you? And I was like, no, like, it's, it's all Santa. He forgot him. Santa, you know, he's, he's he, busy. Makes, he makes mistakes too. He was in a hurry. I don't believe you. And walked off. I'm like, you little fucker. So he was mm. he he noticed me at Santa last year and was done it. And so 
I'm doing it twice this year for kids. And now the gig is up for him. I, well, he knew I wasn't the real Santa anyways. I've even made comments to him about it. And I know that you judge. Well, I work for Santa. He knows you've been bad. So, and if you fuck with me, he's going to be really bad so for you this year. Up, boy. And I had, socks I had, and underwear I gave, for you. I gave him the old, well, like, if you don't believe, like, that's, you know, that's on you. And so I think I might have him back, but mm. it's fun. The whole Christmas scene for little kids, it's, it's a lot of fun. And it's and the I last don't magical thing left in their life. Yeah. And, and I don't know I don't know what age I break it to him, but you don't. You let him figure it out on their own. And kids today, well, I don't want him to be the sophomore that's like, "What's Santa bringing me?" <laughs> <laughs> well, he'll he'll trust me. He'll know by the time fifth grade it all ends. When you get to junior high, eighth grade kid can't wait to tell you. Uh, we got a bunch of fat ass kids too in this world. Yeah, I was picking those kids up and putting them on my lap last year. God Almighty, we need some. We need eating some <laughs> yogurt and lettuce. <laughs> oh yeah, my like, God Almighty. <laughs> You need knee replacement you know, after? Crawl up and jump. I mean, Santa's lap there, and I'm <clears throat> picking Junior up. I'm like, God almighty. <laughs> you know, like, what do you need besides a Peloton, kid? I saw an interesting thing. The cigarette companies bought, like, Nabisco and a whole bunch of, like, food brands. And they have... Um, Philip Morris did? Huh? Philip Morris bought... I'll find, I'll find the video. But anyway, the, the cigarette companies bought a lot of these uh, food companies... And they have um, put similar, like, chemicals and shit in it. We were looking at a picture. It was a beach in the 70s. Oh, everybody's skinny. Everybody's skinny. And everybody smoked, and everybody ate, you know, fat mm -hmm. and lard and, like, way healthier 50 years ago. Yeah, we were a lot today. healthier people. But people got old fast there <clears throat> because when I was a kid growing up in the 70s, there wasn't any hot 50, 60-year-old women out there. It was almost impossible. What's called There's, plastic surgery. Yes, and fake titties, <laughs> you know, and secondhand titties. One guy pays for them, another one plays with them. But there are prettier women today that are older than there was back then. Mm. Back then, people, there was grandpa and grandma. People mm. were old. Mm. People don't get as old as quick no more as they used to. So we're fatter, but we're prettier than we used to be. Mm. But we are a fat society. Even you can watch a movie. You can watch Smokey and the Bandit in the 70s when they're down with, uh, or uh, not, James Bond does one where he's down around New Orleans in the Chafalaya Basin. Yeah. And Jackie, Gle or not Jackie Gleason, I can't remember the guy's name, plays the sheriff down there. Everybody around them is the same size. Everybody. You watch the street, they're walking down a parade or something. Everybody's thin. Somebody that was fat back then is just big today. That's just that guy's a big, some bitch in shape right there. Back yeah. then, he was considered a fat guy. Yeah. But you didn't have fat people. And so they bought the chemical company. The, the, I think this They were putting good. the same products in the cigarettes that they were putting the um, preservatives and shit. Hold on. I think this might be the video. I, just, I figured they were in the business of addictive addictive things in your body because I would say modified sugars are just as addictive as nicotine. Probably the worst thing in the world is sugars. Yeah, for sure. Especially uh, Andy's wife asked me one time, are you addicted to sugar? Fuck yeah, like like a crackhead is crack. You like barbecue sauce? Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. It's sweet. Yeah. Tastes good. Philip Morris. Is that Morgan Freeman narrated? Yeah. That's what... That's what led me to believe this was legit. Mm -mm. This new machine operates with specific targets in mind, like addicting consumers without them knowing it. So I do, anyway. I do like some snack food though. But it was all big tobacco is now just big food, and um, so yeah, that's why we're all addicted to bad shit. But no, sugar is the worst. I wonder if. What the difference is, and I, and I could look on back. I like popcorn. I eat a bag of popcorn about, in the off season, I have one every day. Because I go to bed at night late, and I watch TV late. And I know microwave popcorn. I don't put no butter on it, but it comes. I wonder what the difference is it on the healthy-wise compared to eating the old Orville Redenbacher, so I pop it myself. Because I like the home pop. I like to pop it myself, too, but I always make a mess, and I don't like to get vented to by my wife, so I don't <laughs> do that all the time. But microwave popcorn. Do you have microwave popcorn? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. do. I like popcorn. I like popcorn. I wonder if microwave is less healthy for you than the regular. You mean because I, it's in the microwave? I wonder if in the additives in the they bag? put in it in the bag compared to just throwing some oil or butter in a pot and cooking it. Well, there's a, there's an easy way to find that I'm out. I'm going to look it up. I've never done that before, but that made the ingredient list. But have you ever seen where they put the butter in the pot 
and they put in some of those uh, Werther's caramels. No. Oh, let me tell you, I've got to make this. They take your regular, like, just pot that you put on the, st- on the stove, and they put butter, stick a butter in there, and like six or eight of those Werther caramels, and let it melt down, and then throw the popcorn in there, and you get p- caramel corn. Mm. Sounds good, don't it? Sounds darn good. When you try that, let me know how it goes, because I know I you're have, going to. I've done cheese popcorn that way. Well, not that way. Just popcorn, and then take a bunch of cheese, and grate it on top, right. and fold it, boom, 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 when it's still warm. I'm big. I like cheese popcorn. I like cheese snacks. I do, too. Who don't like cheese? Them Bay Bells were my killer. I ate Bay Bell every night. I do. That's my snack at night. I have two little Bay Bell, the good. Swiss, or the, I like them. The cheese and wine. Like, is that, like, when you were, when you want to be fancy, do, do you, like, put out, like, a nice uh, charcuterie board with different cheeses and wines and stuff like that, or is that not your style? No, uh, I mean, I like those things. Look, I've made a good living um, working in restaurants all my life, putting together boards just like that for paying customers. So, like, doing that for a party, a Super Bowl party or a dinner party, whatever, like, that's not what, like, gets my creative juices going, right. you know? Uh, but there is, there is a hundred percent validity to like cheese being a very artisanal thing, right? Same with charcuterie. Like these things are not, it's not like, I think America specifically, we look at salami from the deli counter and be like, you know, get that slice. It comes from, um, what's that brand? Um, Hormel. Hormel or, um. He was thinking a little more upper end than that. Wow. Yeah. But, oh, Meyer. Boar's Head. But, but, yeah, Boar's Head. But, you know, uh, and it probably think, oh, it just came like that. Same with ham. But right. those things take a lot of time and process to make. And so, but I, I'm, I look, I'm, I like a cheese recruiter. We, we buy nice cheese. In fact, I think, so I don't think, I know that Kroger bought Murray's Cheese, which is a famous cheese shop in New York. And there's a lot of Murray's cheese now in Kroger's. There's one right in my, my town in Montgomery, and we love it because there's all kind of really nice cheeses from all over the world in that Kroger. I don't. In fact, it's probably the only reason why I go to Kroger and not <laughs> HEB is because their cheese selection is so good. So big fan of that. But, I, I mean, the whole, like, idea of, like, charcuterie boards and cheese boards and, you know, as some sort of status symbol when your friends come over and drink wine, I don't know. Like, I look at that and, like, I've been doing that since 2006, you know, I've been, right. but not for just, it's part of my, it was part of my like restaurant job, you know? Right. So I don't look at it as like this. There are some really good cheeses out there and there's some cheeses that cost a lot of money that taste like shit. We go to a cheese shop in Salem, Massachusetts every time we're up there, which is right kind of down by the um, landing pad or whatever the hell they call that where all the, all the old cemetery is. Mm-hmm. And we go there and we bought some stuff last time and, Michelle bought some fancy crackers. Not a fan of the fancy crackers. I wanted some damn z- saltines or some zest crackers. But we had, uh, she bought some cheeses and we bought some kind of stilton cheese or something. Ooh. You're it's, not a blue cheese fan. Fuck no. This shit's yeah. nasty. You might as well be a moldy sock. <laughs> stuff's horrible. <laughs> I do like a blue cheese. Michelle loves it. Boy, blah, blah, blah. Oh, that stuff's horrible. I mean, I do like a blue cheese, but they do have, they do have some that, you know, smells like my growing after four days of oh food. it's you know, freaking like, nasty shit there's a steakhouse in new york that like dry ages their beef or something for like an ungodly amount of yeah. time and the lady was eating it and she's like oh yeah i can taste the blue cheese Whoa. <laughs> i don't want blue cheese on my mm. steak yeah i i like i like a good dry <clears throat> age steak but if you take it past like 60 days for me and you start getting into the 80 and hundreds like then you start changing the flavor of what i came to eat right this was and 120 days, I think, too. I yeah. can't remember they, what it was. It was it was They'll take it for moldy it. shit. They take it for my steak is green. Oh yes, sir. That's how the they, best. <laughs> how do they figure out that that works? Like there was somebody that like was like, fuck, what are we gonna eat tonight? I've had those steaks in the freezer for 60 days. Let me try it. Well, think about it. That's that's history, though. Mm-hmm. There's literally centuries and centuries and centuries of history saying that we could do that. Right. So now they just control do it in a controlled environment with with meat aging coolers and such. But in the history of food, we have long as a society, in fact, cheese is a perfect example of one of preserving our foods through time and controlled mold. Um, beef is one of them. Cheese is one of them. So, like sm- actually anything smoked because the nitrates that come off of smoked meats mm-hmm. that happen when you burn things, that's a preservation. Bacon has been preserved with sodium nitrates. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you know, like, so we've, as a society, as a human society throughout the history of people have been doing things like that. And so, you know, what you're talking about is not new discovery. It's right. just learning how to do it in a way that you have a lot of control and it's safe, you know, right. It's not always safe to keep your meat in a fridge for 120 days and right. then eat it, but in a controlled environment, with the right temperature and moisture content, you can, you know, circumvent bad bacteria growth. How would they do it back in the old days? Like how would they, when they didn't have the freaking hang it outside when it's 40, 50 degrees, you know, like if you, if you're in South Louisiana, you're not aging beef outside. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Um, but you may be salting fish. Like, I mean, think about that. Like the shrimp sheds in Louisiana, mm -hmm. you get the little dried shrimp packets in the grocery store. Well, how do you think they do that? They, they historically, they used to put them on their roof, little shrimp on their roof, dry them on their roof and then put them up and, and then sell them. How the hell do they keep the, the birds Lies. off of them? That's well, crazy. Yeah. I it's don't a different know. world back then. A little fly larva didn't kill you back then. Yeah. That's just shit. But like stuff. those, I mean, they just figure it out. You know, they like, Think about all the, like, we take food for granted now because we can get it at a grocery store. We can order it from Amazon. We can get it from Uber Eats, whatever mm -hmm. it is. But back in the day, like, you caught something, you hunted something, you grew something. It didn't matter how many freaking tomatoes your garden <laughs> put out. You weren't giving them away. You were drying them to preserve them for later. You were making sauce with them. You know, ducks were, you know, you just you just didn't throw things away. So you became resourceful and, 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 you know, different techniques grew like salting, like people have been salting fish since Jesus. Right. Right. Like yeah. since before that people ate then to survive. We eat for our pleasure nowadays. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean, back in 1780, if you slaughtered a, a, a cow or a pig or whatever it was, you, you may have made it where it tasted good, but you ate that to survive and mm -hmm. you got as much meals as, as you can. Nowadays we throw away more stuff than we consume. A lot of people do. It's sad. Even the lodge here, we have tons of leftovers all the time on stuff because you, you plan on 30 people showing up here, and sometimes you get 30 firemen, so you got to feed for 50. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you get 30 people that are running a marathon the next week, and there's not much. So there's always leftovers and stuff. But back then, people didn't have waste. Like you said, they used every bit of it. How many women today know how to can? Jesse's mother in law cans. No, her mother. My mother in law. I mean, your, your mother in law. Yeah, Jesse's mother in law does not can. No, that's no. Michelle. Yeah, she buys cans. <laughs> that's it. I love but, Yeah. Michelle does not. Michelle don't know how to can. Michelle's grandmother probably did. Jesse's mother can can. She's very good at. It. She makes the best beats I've ever had, and I love them. But I wish I knew how to do that, and I don't. And I could learn, but I'm too fucking lazy. Mm. But we need. But more people don't know how to do that. We don't. We we have. That's a lost art in our country, and that one day is going to bite a lot of people in the ass. I, they don't know how to do shit like I that. I do think. Um, you know, we can say what we want about technology and. You know this the discovery of things through the internet and all and all that stuff that comes with it, but I do believe we're seeing it's not it's not like this big wave of people going now canning and preserving things and so on. Mm -hmm. But because now we can look up on YouTube how to can something, there's more and more people that want to make want to do those things, um, which I think is a good thing, right? And I I mean I learned how to how to can things from my parents because we had this big fig tree, and there was no way we could eat the five gallons of figs every week that we would harvest off the tree for two months, we make fig jam, fig preserves. And that's mm -hmm. how I learned to make preserves and then can things and so on. I've never had a fig that wasn't in a Newton. Really? In my life. I, I mean, it is. I don't think so. Here's the thing about a fig. The reason, like, the, probably the reason why a lot of people haven't had figs outside of a Newton are just good figs because the best time to eat a fig is, is like there's a window of like 24 hours. And so if you're getting figs at the grocery store, they are picked way too mm -hmm. in advance because they can't ship them right. completely right. But a perfectly ripe fig is one of the best things you will ever, best fruit for sure that you'll ever put in your mouth. And it's just one of those, it's one of those God given <laughs> like things that you guys have to be there for, you know, like a, 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 a a productive fig tree and that's yours that you can go pick and do um when you're getting when when they are there they are beyond um yeah beyond explanation i mean you look at the mediterranean the turk turkey the folks in turkey greece 
uh, Croatia, all throughout that area, like huge fig growing cultures. And that's why it dates back into the earliest books of written language. You see figs, the fig leaf over Adam and Eve's mm-hmm. private parts and so on. It's, it is historical in a way. And I mean, I, I'm, I'm a big fan, as you can tell. But I think that's partially because I grew up with this very productive right. fig tree that was bigger than this room. That produced so many figs, and it's how I remember like all these fond memories of cooking with my family. But then you, it doesn't take long for you traveling to go in some of these other cultures, who like really have a place in their society for this fruit. Really good. No, the fig and cream cheese is, goes together, right? Or am I mistaken on this? Yeah, why not? I, mean, I don't know. That's great. what I was thinking. Yeah. I don't. Know. I don't know. I've never had a fig in my life other yeah. than like sitting in a Newton. What I is it? No what, like you just. You just know, but does it change colors when it's time to pick it? So there's this little hole. All right, so the fig has a stem, and on the bottom side of that fig, there's a little hole, and it kind of, you know. How big does it Kind of looks like a butthole. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Uh, and when it starts to split, that's when. That's, that's when, when, when you get it. That's when they're ripe. How big do they get? How, what, is it depends, fig- on the, it depends, depends on the fig. There's some figs that will get uh, the size of a like a small mandarin. You know, so Jeez. roughly, um, uh, like, so it's like a plum. Yeah, some will get the size of plum. Some only like the size of a golf ball. You know, really just depends because there's you know brown figs, green figs, cadota figs, striped figs. Uh, there's there's and, and that's a, a southern. Different. It's a southern thing. Well, in Louisiana, they figs like hot and humid. That's what they want. They want hot and humid, and they don't want any cold. Mm-hmm. Like so, if if you if you get some cold years, like cold, uh, not cold years, cold days in Louisiana, it may stunt the figs fig trees' growth, and it may not be as productive. That rarely happens in Louisiana or in Turkey or in Greece and so on in those Mediterranean places. But the the kind of the rule of thumb is hot and humid. That's what they want. They they wouldn't do good here because it gets too cold. I had a guy that used to hunt with us, and he passed away. And he come every year, and he'd come about this time. And he was from southern Louisiana, he was south of New Orleans, between New Orleans and. Um, God dang it. What's the place at the very end of the world? Venice. Uh, Venice. Mm-hmm. And um, he would bring clementines up here every year. You call uh, satsumas. They, that's it. Yeah. I call them clementines. That, I can't. Satsumas. Satsuma mandarin. Just a little orange mandarin orange. Yeah, usually seedless. Yes. And yep. he, he and he liked them with bourbon, though. Yeah. So if you watch Duck Camp Dinners season one, one of the, fr- I think on episode one of Duck Camp Dinners, I make a duck a l'orange mm-hmm. and we mm-hmm. use satsuma mandarins for it because- at the time when we're duck hunting, satsumas are coming in season. And so we like to really cook. I mean, there's always a bag of satsumas at the duck camp, you know, in your, in your, in your uh, blind bag and so on. Um, but yeah, that, that's a, that's the kind of the pride and joy citrus of Louisiana is the satsuma. It, it, and they're real prominent between around Venice, between Venice and new Orleans. I saw tons of trees. Yeah, Saint, before. St. Bernard parish is a big citrus growing, which is what you're talking about. St. Bernard, um, is a big citrus growing parish and community, but I, all, all of South Louisiana grows really good. Citrus. Satsumas is what Satsuma, they're called. S-A-T, um, S-A-T-S-U-M-A. He would always come up here and bring me a bag or two of those. And he would always he would he would bring a couple of bags and he'd say whatever we don't drink these are yours and they would mix them with their bourbon and whatever they were drinking that, that doesn't surprise me at all <laughs> and they were good because I had a couple of drinks with them and they were very good yeah but they're 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 delicious you know they can be compared to like your uh like your cuties at the grocery store that's what they would right. remind me of yes. but you know once you have one and then have a cutie you're like oh wait this isn't really the same because the satsumas are just you know, like like the fig that we just talked about, you're getting them at the peak of their season in a very place that is great to grow. No, they were they were very good. But any, any other coon asses coming up can bring me some satsumas. There you go. But that, they were they were good though. But that's something you don't find in the store here. Do they juice them ever? I've never seen them juiced. I've never seen them juiced. I mean, that's kind of that would kind of be a, a waste in in my. I just because they just they eat so well as a segmented kind of snack with no seeds. I mean, mo- you know, some have seeds, but most of them uh, don't. Um, yeah, but they just got this really premium sweet honey kind of thing. They're nice and balanced, not too, you know, touch a little tart, but easy to peel. I mean, everything you love about. It's funny. I had um, upstate New York went to a place that was a market and they sold homemade juiced orange juice. And it was really good. I don't know what kind of oranges they use, but it was a real sweet orange juice. Yeah. And I'm, I think it was some sort of mandarin or type orange that they were using. It wasn't a navel yeah. orange. Valencia, maybe. Maybe, maybe it was. They were very good though. It was real sweet. Very, yeah. 
almost too sweet. Mm. It would have been really good with vodka. It was, it was really, it was good. Though. Valencia's make a good, good orange to juice. I would say, yeah, they're really good. Um, we'll, we'll start wrapping up. I just heard Jeff's camera about to blink, and I know uh, you got a long drive ahead of you. That's right, headed to Arizona. Are you going to El Paso? Or are you going through Albuquerque? I think I'm going to go through El Paso. Do you know Albuquerque's got a Papa Do's? It's only Papa Do's I've been to in my life that has green chilies on their shit. That, yeah, You're not I a Papa Do's fan, though, or, or are you? I'm not really. That's because you eat that fan. stuff all the time. Yeah. The shrimp brochettes are the way to go at Papa Do's. Shrimp and grits. Mm, I've never been guy. to like the Papa Do's. I've been to their Mexican joint. I've been to their barbecue. Papa Papa yeah. and Papa Brothers. Yep. I've Papa. been to those. I've never been to a Papa Do's, though. Papa Do's used to have my favorite sandwich. They had a shrimp po' boy. But they got cheap on their shrimp. They used a little Brazilian. You used to have the big butterfly shrimp on them, mm-hmm. and they were a lot better then. And that roumelade sauce that they make is really good. I'm sure it's all fake to you. I mean, that's. Uh, you know. I mean, look, you're in Houston. That's close. That's pretty close. There's a lot of Louis- Louisiana transplants in, in Houston. Well, Landry's is from down there. That's right. And Landry's is just like Papa Do's, I think. Same type of food, yeah. same restaurant. I don't know that I've ever been to Landry's. Yeah, you have. We have had, I? Yeah, we've eaten one at Corpus Christi one time. And we've eaten at one in um, San Antonio. Y'all like, we have. Y'all like Corpus Christi? Corpus Christi? I mean, I wouldn't want to live down there. No. It's too fucking far south. It's not a bad place. I wouldn't mind. San, if I could pick a big city to live to in Texas, if I had to live in a big city in Texas, it used to be I'd live in Fort Worth, but it's becoming a liberal shithole just like the rest of them. So San Antonio maybe, mm. and I'm sure it's probably the same way, but San Antonio is a pretty place. I just I, I want to live somewhere with weather changes. Mm. That's why I don't like Texas that much. I would not live in Austin. And I would not live in Dallas. I would choose Amarillo. That's Amarillo. that'd be my big city. I would live in in Texas because it's far enough up north. At, Lubbock, uh, Texas. See, we love. You, you like Lubbock? That's where I went to college. Mm. Well, Lubbock wouldn't be a bad Red place Raider, to live, huh? Yeah, graduated in two thousand eleven. So I love Texas, but I just wish I can get to the coast easier. And mm-hmm. I wish there was a coast that I, like. It's nasty here. Was nice. You know what the problem in Texas is? From Corpus Christi to South Padre Island, it's all private. And maybe that's one thing that still makes it nice because there ain't a place in the United States of America that you can go to a beach that's not over-commercialized. Nowhere. If, if it's not over-commercialized, it's because it's inhabitable, like yeah. some of the places in Louisiana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, you're there up to your ass and mosquitoes and alligators and there's no way, and sharks and you can't get to it. But anywhere in this country, from the top of Maine all the way to Seattle, Washington, every place along the ocean, there's no places that are that are not overpopulated. When I was a kid, we used to go to... Uh, Desti- what do you mean? What do you mean? I don't understand. There's, fucking, there's houses built on every fucking beach across everywhere in the country. Oh. Everywhere. So you you're talking like a private beach that you, you can go or just a not- place that you that you could just go pull up in your truck and sit on the beach and enjoy yeah. it. Yeah. There's right. none of them places are left. We went to Unless South they're Ca- ugly. That's what I'm saying. Unless they're just inhabitable, like from Corpus Christi to Brownsville, Texas, the South Padre Island area is nice. I don't consider it a nice beach by any by beach going by any means, but but it's a beach. Venice, Louisiana. I told Michelle, hmm. listen to this, we're in New Orleans, and I said, hey, I've always wanted to go to Venice, Louisiana. She goes, what for? I said, I just want to see it. I want to see where the Mississippi drops into it. I love going to, I, I like geography. I want to see it. I said, we can go have a, so we'll go to the beach there, and we'll go eat dinner somewhere really nice and stuff. Every place else in the country has got a place you can eat at. Except for Venice, Louisiana. They got a marina. That's it. That's exactly right. <laughs> and no beach. She goes, uh, what are you going to get, Jeff? Some of them alligator uh, chips or whatever they have. Those, uh, You know what I'm talking Fried about? alligator bites or yeah. something like I said, that? No. So we ended up going back to New Orleans and eating again at the same places we always eat at. But there's no place like that. You go to South Carolina where we're at, the beach. You mm-hmm. go to Cape May, New Jersey, the beach. Maine. Everywhere you go just about is overpopulated. You just when I was a kid, we'd go to Destin, Florida. So this has been like 76, 77. You could pull a motorhome or something on the beach at Destin, Florida, and you could sit there and you might not see 15 people for a day or two. Because there were still places that weren't just overdone. How that's changed. Everything right? it is. Everything's oh, over. Yeah. The first time I went to uh uh Panama City after I was a grown man, I was like, What the fuck? They opened Disney World here? I mean, it's just shops and it's in that but it's anywhere in our country it's that way. Mm. You know? So that's what's so Corpus Christi, the beach at Port Aransas, is just like being anywhere else. Miami Beach, there's not much difference. Mm. I mean, we were just we've been kind of thinking about it, like is is Montgomery our home? Like, are you thinking if, about moving to Corpus Christi? I just want to be close to the. I just closer to any beach, whether that's Texas or Charleston or or Florida. Well, I'd rather know? live in Corpus Christi than I would Galveston. Yeah, 
that we went to Galveston too to the Higgle Lagoon. And we went, eh, probably not. This have one. you been? Have you been? To, <laughs> have you been to South Padre? No. South Padre is a local place though. During the summertime, they have a lot of yeah influx sure. of people. But it's funny. I know a guy that's a fishing guy down there, and he bitches about the tourist. Well, he don't mind taking my money when I go fishing with him. I'm a tourist too. But always, you know, they love it in the wintertime when there's no tourists there. They love it. And so I think it would not be probably a bad place to raise your kids and family South on the, on the on South Padre Island, I don't think. But there's not very many places you can be along the beach anymore that's yeah. not. Charleston, South Carolina, damn sure ain't that place. No, but, I mean, you can still access beach from there, even though if you don't have a house on it. You yeah. Know, like, what was that place we were at? Was it something Folly? Folly Beach. Folly Beach. Yeah, and it was really nice. I mean, the beaches were clean and nice. But we went to Hilton Head after that. Hilton Head was nice. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, it's... That whole little area, you know. Yeah. Bluffton and mm-hmm. all that, that area. The Outer Banks of New, 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 yeah. North Carolina. But you can't go anywhere in this country that's just not overgrown. Have you been to Rye, New Hampshire? No. It's a really cool place. Another place. That's a place I would like to live, too. But I've never been there in the summer. Mm. They say it's fucking just like just bananas. South Padre Island or Daytona Beach during spring break with people. Mm. It, it just... It, well, if you're going to live in a place like that, that comes with the territory, right. knowing that you're going to have this kind of seasonal shift and wave of people that come in and out. Mm-hmm. I, I tell you where you can go that's not an overcrowded beach is Ocean Shores, Washington. It wasn't crowded, was it? The beach? No, but I mean, it wasn't very pretty either. It's 52 degrees and you can't see out 50 yards because of the fog. What do you want? Like you're just wanting like that beach atmosphere or is there something that you're looking for going to the beach? I I love the smell. I love the right. way the wind feels. I love... Key West. I love knowing that the ocean is like... The, the only frontier that we haven't really discovered or can right. or we're never going to conquer never it. Gonna conquer it. No. And I like having knowing that that wild is mm-hmm. just kind of bashing up against land. I think there's just something I just feel at home and at peace when I'm near the water. And that's probably because I grew up in South Louisiana where I can be there in 15, be at a boat launch in 15 minutes. Um, I don't know, man. It's just always been something about it from a little boy, from since I was a little boy, and I kind of, you know, now now that I have a son, I, right. I, I will always wish I was kind of raised near a beach, and now I now I maybe get a chance to raise my son near the beach. And my wife's the same way; she just loves the ocean and loves the beach. And she's from Midland, Texas, you know, so <laughs> she didn't grow up with that, but she loves it. And everywhere we go, it where it's Thailand or Charleston. International, domestic, we are going to spend time at a beach. Puerto That's, Rico. It's a pretty place. Food sucks from what, from what I remember the last, yes. our yeah, last podcast. <laughs> yeah, that was not, <laughs> Puerto Rican food was not, Mufongo? We had pizza. Should be fungus. <laughs> Fuck, that stuff's horrible. We, we, oh. we did order a good pizza there, so like, it wasn't, it wasn't all bad. That's, That's not Breakfast good. was good. Yeah, brunch. breakfast was really good, but I'm not, yeah, I was not overly knocked down by the, I like Mexican food. And I don't know why I was thinking Mexican food would be the same in Puerto Rico as Puerto Rican food, but it's not. It's not. No, yeah. not not even close. Mexican food is so much better. But the Mexican food on different coasts is different. The West Coast Mexican food, I don't like near like I do the uh, the Tex-Mex stuff on our side. Mm. You know, so Ooh. it's just a difference. You love the you mm. love the West part? <sighs> yeah, I mean, they do some really they really, you know, I find they're if you're talking about, you know, they do more traditional Mexican than what you would have Tex-Mex, yes, right? Yes, they like, do. You know, smaller corn tacos, burritos, uh, but burritos out of San Diego. And you said you were, who said, didn't, you said you wanted to take Pacific Coast? Yeah, we're going to go from San Diego all the way to Seattle. Make sure you get a burrito in San Diego. Oh, do, I would do, do a little research, go get a burrito in San Diego. And they, I, I don't know, there's just something about the way they do them. I like Port of Arda. We went to Port of Arda last year. I hadn't been there since I was in college. And it was a neat place. I think it's still, it's to me, it's like going to old Mexico. Mm. Their ceviche is not as good as the ceviche in Cancun area is. And this year we're going to go to Cosmail, which I like ceviche a lot. So and they didn't have it on the West Coast. And you damn sure don't order ceviche in Massachusetts. That is a no-brainer out there. They brought it out to me, and it had cucumbers and zucchini in it. Mm. That is not fucking ceviche. Yummy. Oh, it was horrible. <laughs> the lady goes, did you not like that? I said, it's just not what I was really wanting. She goes, I'll take that off the bill. I said, no, I ordered it. Yeah, it's well, just not kind of you. It's not yeah. ceviche though. But ugh. I ordered it. It was my it was my mistake. My mistake. It. I should have ordered and I should have read the fine print that said cucumber and zucchini ceviche. Oh, it was bad. Mm-mm-mm. But I love I love that west coast of Mexico. I just didn't like the food as much as I do on. But I like Tex Mex food better. Yeah. Never had mole ever, so I don't know. They people say it's really really good. And the girls that work here makes mole. Central Mexico. Yeah. yeah. 
No, they're real Mexicans that work here. We have some real Mexicans. You come to Stanfield <laughs> Hanging Outfitters, you're going to get some real Mexican food. You're either going to have white girl food or Mexican food. There ain't going to be nothing in between. You can't. You can't have it anywhere else. There's an interesting show on uh, Netflix called Ancient Apocalypse, and it's about... Um, just started watching that. Did you? Yeah. I got the first two episodes. I'm, I think I'm three or four, but it's a it, it's interesting. But you What's were talking it on? about... It's on Netflix. Ancient Apocalypse. So I have to look Apocalypse. on my account because I think you're probably watching it on my account. No, 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 I'm on my account. Did you get you an account? You liar. Well, I'm, I've got my name that yeah. I'm watching it on. <laughs> like, it's not in your little channel. But uh, just the ocean, man. I mean, it's this wild place. They think they discovered, could have discovered Atlantis. and Again? There's there's good evidence here. Do you, think, do you think aliens cr- use the um, ocean as a portal? It's a good, serious question now. Yeah, I mean, now we're getting into Rogan conversation. I'm asking. Like. <laughs> yeah. Do you? Yeah. Um, no. Only because I don't know much about that subject. I believe in aliens 100%. Right. I think they do. There's a lot of places off the coast, the west coast off San Diego, they say that they go in and out of. <clears throat> Pop out of the water. They, come I mean, the water. I've seen they the go right, they go right, right in and come right out of it. I just, you know, I think my mind, I'm just only speaking for myself, just cannot wrap my head around that idea. What right. would it take for you to to believe that if you saw it yourself, or then would you be, would you second guess what you saw? Yeah, I would have to see. I would have to feel like I've seen clear, hard evidence at the very least. Um, yeah, I think there's evidence for sure that we have UFOs. The video always seems just so it always shit. Sh- it's like Bigfoot. Yeah, yeah, it's not like they're filming an IMAX movie on them. Never, but, but like all these high tech kind of planes, government planes that we have there to film and everything. Right. Like we can send a missile. F- 5,000 miles away and bomb this little right. area in Kazakhstan, but we can't, we can't get, a, get good a good video picture. of this. But good point. I, um, I talked to someone in the military just recently. We are talking about the hypersonic missiles. They travel, I think, at thirty five to 3,800 miles an hour. They go 60 miles a second or something, or whatever it was. We did the math on it. Yeah. We have the technology to do something that can go that fast. But we can't find track a damn spaceship flying through our atmosphere ever how fast they're going. Because I assume they fly hypersonic. But I there's mean, been too many. Can somebody just break out their iPhone? I feel right. like that's a much better option. Than well, like right. going on. the Navy pilot. Yeah. And first, someone's going to check me on my math on the 6,000 or 3,800 miles an hour. But I think it was pretty close to that hypersonic goes or the hypersonic. But that I saw the jet, the fighter jet, which is the greatest thing we have right now in our technology. They fly what? Thousand, twelve, thirteen hundred miles an hour, or something, mm-hmm. and something passes them going by, and that's just crazy to think there's something that fast that's out there that's not man-made. So it has to be something UFOs, and that can move in the way. It yes, they erratic. Right yeah. Just go back and forth with that. The G's would kill a human being at that. Mm. I mean, you can't. That's why we can't ever go hypersonic. They say our bodies would 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 disintegrate going hypersonic. I always wonder what it would do to society if they told everybody, "Oh yeah, they're real." What would you do? Like I just wonder if there would be this mass panic on a on a global level, and it would just be chaos. I don't think so now because of the downfall of Christianity. Maybe not. Not enough people believe in the Good Book anymore. Hmm. You know, in the Good Book, that it says it says he created heaven and earth. He didn't say that. That's right. We were the only one. But we've been taking it for our whole life that we're the only people, the only creatures, or what? I don't. What? I don't think so. Well, I, I think that that's the reason why. But if you watch Ancient Apocalypse, maybe there were people that could get off of this rock because that's the whole premise is that he, it's Graham Hancock. He's been on Rogan a bunch, but he, he, his idea is that we were a very civilized society and something major happened and wiped away that whole, um, uh, that whole generation or that whole uh, human race civilization that had this technology. He said, like, if you look at the great, the, the Sphinx, he said, I don't think that it was a Pharaoh's head to begin with. He said, if you look at um, the rest of the body and the erosion, it, the, the, it doesn't add up to when they say it was made. He said, plus the head is misshaped. It's much smaller in proportion to the body. He said, so I think that there was another head on there that the Egyptians found, and then they made it a Pharaoh. They, car- they whittled it down. But... <clears throat> Maybe maybe there was uh, maybe there was something that could get off of here. 
He makes an interesting kind of point about all these, you know, we, we hear about like the great flood in the Bible, mm-hmm. and Noah's Ark and so on. And, but all these other, every civilization, civilization has, has a story like that, yep. almost exactly like that. And it's all kind of different characters, but this idea of a worldwide catac what do you call it? A catechism, cataclysmic, event. cataclysmic event of wiping out society. Mm-hmm. And, and then he kind of says, after he makes that point, like, what if societies, you know, they come in and come out and yeah. like they, and they have to rebuild and we're just, we're in the society that's been rebuilt from that flood. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we're going to get wiped out again. Well, if you, we could, but I mean, they were talking, history uh, repeats itself yeah. all the time. Um, cause he was talking about the ice age and what happened was, so all of this, all of this water, like basically floods the earth, but that's counterintuitive to it being an ice age because mm. your water would freeze. But he said, somehow we got this big mass rush of water globally. And he's like, he thinks it's probably a comet. If you watch, if it, it, this, this has absolutely zero to do with science, but just to show, if you watch Armageddon, that's what the deal. If this thing hits in the right. Pacific Ocean, it's going to cause a massive tidal wave that's going to wipe out the East Coast. Then the people on the or the West Coast, and then the people on the East Coast, they're going to die from a nuclear winter because right. all the stuff's going to block out the sun. So there's your, the, yeah. you know, the Mayan civilization. What happened to it? Yeah. I mean, those they, were some smart people. Yeah. yeah. They were talking about you, that. You look like at their there's... pyramids and they line it perfectly right. They were some smart people. There ain't some, some bitch living in a cave that's whittling wood to build a fire to eat a dinosaur that's all of a sudden figured out how to make, yeah. you know, astronomy equal up to the sun and the moon and the stars and all that shit. You should watch it because he, he points out a lot of that. Like, yeah. we didn't just come from, like, these Neanderthal people right. in caves. No. And, like, to, the, the, let's to build, build the pyramids. The let's build the pyramids. Right. Yeah. And there's there's another set of pyramids that perfectly, it 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 lines up. They're all, they all face different ways. And they're like, that's fucking weird. Like, why did they build these? They're all built the same, but they all have, like, different angles to where the doors are. Is this one in Mississippi or the uh, no, Ohio? No, it's, it's overseas. But evidently there was a star that you could only see, and that star, like they figured out the calculations of like the wobble that we make in the galaxy, and like the mm-hmm. pyramid that they built were upon a star, but it was at different That's crazy. points of the arc that it takes in the sky at different years and different decades. But yeah, it's like he said, like, History would have you believe that we were cave people and then we just built this shit. It's like, no, there like had to be a ratcheting up. Or somebody that came in and taught us. Or somebody that was from a lost generation, mm-hmm. like Ad- or uh, like Noah, mm-hmm. just a handful of people that had this information that could share it with us. Well, I did not realize that the biggest pyramid on earth was in Mexico. Yeah. Chitsunia? I, I think so. I it's just, uh, the 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 girth or whatever maybe not as high but <coughs> what's well, crazy it's a good show. what they could do even the Roman Empire they had toilets that flushed in their houses mm-hmm. and they had water that would they get hot water and cold water and shit there's there's places thirty years ago in the United States of America you couldn't get hot water and cold water I mean they just still can't get drinking water yeah in some of them Flint, right Flint Michigan yep. you know but they could do it in the Russian Empire they they say and I and and, and I've read this before. That at the Roman Colosseum, they could flood that up and they could do battleships. They do like like a Vegas deal, you know, where they had the mm. that Treasure Island, the battleship. They could do that at the in, during the, in the Colosseum. They could flood that and drain it and stuff. What happened? All of a sudden, we're dragging people behind freaking horses again, and we quit knowing how to do shit. I mean, right. it's the chair. When when did white man or brown man or whoever invent the wheel? But when you come over to the Native Americans. They we didn't were, have it. We're fucking dragging people in the 1600s still. Yeah. You know? They had gunpowder over there. 4,000 BC was the, when the wheel got Yeah, and we're, and we're slinging rocks and sticks over here still. So it's just, there's, there, that's what I mean. There's a gap of technology that did not happen in the United States mm-hmm. because none of this stuff is in the United States. Now, you get the Mayans that had a lot of technology, but you don't have any technology in the United States up until we came here in the 1640s or 50s on a boat. So why was this left off of everything? That's what gets me. If we had enough technology, because they say that the, they say the Mayans had flying machines, and Leonardo da Vinci, what was he in the twelve hundreds, fourteen? I mean, he had pictures of flying hmm. deals he had. 
But we waited until the Wright brothers until, what, 1908? Right. Yeah. I don't know. All right. Let's get out of here. Um, Duck Camp Dinner Season 2 is on Meat Eater right now. That's right. Check it out. Um, Are you filming Duck Camp Dinner 3 or would I talk about it? Um, no, I mean, I'm filming, I'm hoping to film a version or something like Duck Camp Dinner Season 3 this year. And hopefully this week, I'm, I'm hoping to get some news. It could be bad news or it could be good news. We'll see. But um, more to come on that. I wish I knew. I wish I had something, to, well, something better to tell you than that. <laughs> but Ooh. right now, two seasons are out of Duck Camp Dinner that you can go watch. That's yeah, right, on Meteor YouTube channel. Well, we're so glad you got to spend the evening with us last night. Michelle was nervous about cooking for you. Wish we had more time with you. Yes, but she was. She really was honored to have you here. Especially after our flop of a hunt today. I wish we could... Uh, oh, we had fun. It was fun, but it was not what I was expecting. I was expecting to go out there and be done by about 8.30. You noticed Jeff did not hunt this morning, didn't you? <clears throat> So no, I thought I thought y'all would be done early this morning too. Just one of them days. The water in the fields is really. Hopefully, it's going to drop a bunch today, and we'll be back to normal again. What I think one group did do good today. So what I think happened is the wind has been out of the north for three days. Today it's out of the south, and if you look at the way the birds flew, the flight line was different. But it is what it is. Yeah, there's twenty thousand birds half a mile from you west. I know that. That didn't help. It sucks. Yeah, but we got some shooting in regardless. Enjoy your trip to. it, through El Paso. Yeah. Be careful yeah. the border. Don't pick up hitchhikers. <laughs> <laughs> it has been a pleasure hunting with you. And if uh, we'd love to get, you know, hooked back up sometime this winter and maybe we can kill a turkey this uh, this spring. Heck yeah. That'd be fun. Appreciate be it, fun. guys. Go take you a nap or something before you hit the road. Yeah. Uh, I think I got to go. There you go. You kidding out? <laughs> yeah. All right. Bye, See everybody. I mean, if I leave. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, go check out all of our great sponsors. Listen, there's some uh, amazing deals going on right now. Go check out Gundog Outdoors, Pacific Calls, Dive Bomb Industry, Boss Shot Shells, uh, Mossberg, Shin Gear Waiters, Lucky Duck, Looking Glass Duck Club, Podcast, Hunt Proof App. Go set it up right now. Alf Outdoor Specialties, Bangtail Whiskey, Stanfield Hunting Outfitters, Dirty Duck Coffee, Ducks Unlimited, and Double T British Kennels. <laughs>